Um, it looks like we have everyone, so I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's um, meeting of May 5th, 2023. Um, today we have a hearing relating to One Care Vermont's uh, final budget. And we'll turn to that shortly, um, but first I'll turn to Ms. Barrett, our executive director for her report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, briefly, uh, want to remind everyone that uh, the board is going on the road. Uh, we went on the road at the end of last year out to Rutland. On June 7th, we will be going to the Morrisville area, Lamoille County. Um, all the details and the agenda will be posted shortly. But we'd encourage folks to um, come and uh, participate in a in an in-person meeting in Lamoille County, and we are very excited to meet those community members. Um, I also want to remind folks in terms of public comment that we have extended the public comment period for One Care Vermont's revised budget until May 24th, and that information is on our website. And for those who wish to comment please submit those to uh, the board so that they can consider them in um, before their vote. And then last but certainly not least is the ongoing public comment period with the next potential all payer model, accepting comments on those which we share with the Agency of Human Services and the administration as they are leading those uh, negotiations for the next potential model. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and we had a meeting this Wednesday, uh, Mark Hage and uh, uh, presentation on reference-based pricing. We have those minutes from um, May 3rd, so I'd like to take those up. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes of May 3rd, 2023? I'll move approval. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Chair Foster, yeah. I will abstain since I wasn't here, but I will be uh, watching the recording. Great, thank you. And the motion carries and the minutes are approved. Um, I believe we have everyone from One Care here who is presenting. Um, and I'll turn to our attorney, uh, Russ McCracken, to swear the witnesses, and then we'll turn to their presentation. Um, thank you, Chair Foster. Um, before I do that, I just I want to make one note that I I know folks um, are being admitted through the lobby for this meeting, but as people come up, we're admitting them. So uh, just for the record, I want to note that um, for the One Care uh, team, who um, from One Care is going to be uh, speaking today. So. From One Care, uh, Vicki Loner, CEO, Sarah Berry, Chief Operating Officer, Tom Boris, Chief Financial Officer, and Dr. Carrie Wolfman, Chief Medical Officer. All right, thanks very much. Um, I will swear you in with the oath uh, prescribed for witnesses. If you would raise your right hands, we'll do it all at once. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Yes, I do. I do. Great. Thank, thank you very much. You're uh, sworn in, and uh, I can turn it back to you, uh, Chair Foster, or just over to the One Care folks to proceed. Um, I'll just say hi, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I reviewed your slides. Thank you for getting them to us the other day. Uh, it was helpful. And um, I'll turn it to you. I, I, the staff informs me you've asked for an hour and a half for your presentation, which sounds great. So we'll go through your presentation um, till about 10 a.m. ish. And if you need a little more time, fine. And then we'll take a break, I think, after that and then turn to board questions. Um, so thank you all for being here and um, we look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you, Chair Foster and members of the board. Um, while the staff, oh, they're really quick at queuing things up. So <laughs> I wanted to say a few opening words um, before the management team really walk through the, the budget modifications that have been made um, and that we're happy to present to you all today. Just to put this into context, this budget, One Care was formed by Vermont healthcare providers for Vermont healthcare providers to be able to succeed in value-based care arrangements. 
as you all know, um, healthcare is hard, messy, and complicated, and the work has been all that through the years. And we have really assembled a coalition of voluntary and willing providers that are 5,000 members strong. And that's something that we should be proud of as a state and a coalition of healthcare providers. We've made progress on several fronts in terms of savings in the public space. We have invested through our collective resources over $100 million in primary care. And even though we've um, had some speed bumps along the way, we've been able to turn about a billion dollars into value-based care arrangements over the five years that we've been working with the state under the all-payer model agreement. I think we're at a critical point um, at One Care Vermont, and our board is currently engaged in a strategic planning process to assess how we are most effective moving our work forward as a provider coalition. I have great faith in our board of managers at One Care Vermont. We have over 20 practicing healthcare providers and executives and four consumers that deeply care about the work that we're doing in Vermont and are going to do their best by Vermonters to provide for the best care, the right time, the right place. And so I'm proud that I've been able to be part of that effort. Today, you're going to hear from our management team about the budget that we're here to present for you that really is the shared resources of Vermont healthcare providers so that they can engage in healthcare reform efforts. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Boris, who's our Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Vicki. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. All right, so we're here to discuss uh, revisions to the 2023 One Care budget to set the table a little bit for the board as well as the public listening in. We submit a budget to the Green Mountain Care Board in the fall of the year preceding the, the fiscal year performance year. That budget contains many estimates. And uh, a few years ago, we established a process by which we would come back to the Green Mountain Care Board in the spring and communicate any material changes that occurred through the negotiating process with payers, through the regulatory process, or just through the passage of time. So we're here to discuss those changes with you. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. Today, so actually, you can go to the next slide, Kelly, please. We're going to start with some general budget updates. This is really the, the numbers side of the discussion, at least the financial side of the discussion, what has changed since we submitted that initial budget. And then we're going to delve into some notable changes, which are a little bit more discretionary in nature and, and reflect responses to some action that happened last winter and early this uh, calendar year. All right, with that, let's dive in. Next slide, please. And you can skip one more. Thank you. All right. We're going to start with attribution. That's where all of our work really begins. Uh, that's the attributed lives that uh, are assigned to one care providers. As you can imagine, with the absence of a Blue Cross contract, which I'll come back to a little bit later on, uh, the attribution counts are down by about 65,000 lives in total. A couple other observations I'd like to share. Uh, Medicare attribution came in a little bit stronger than anticipated. We assumed around 67,000. It came in around 68, uh, so slight uptick there. Uh, bigger news in the Medicaid space. Medicaid attribution came in quite strong relative to the initial estimates that we prepared last summer. Some of this is just the way attribution works. It's, we're a recipient of attribution and uh, we're trying to guess as best we can the number that will come through. But we also did some very deliberate work in partnership with DIVA to refine the attribution methodology and ensure we are capturing everybody who should be captured through the attribution model. It particularly affected FQHC. So I think that was a, a really good outcome that we were able to get a little bit more out of the Medicaid attribution run. Commercial, you can see going down uh, quite significantly, 83,000 fewer lives in the initial uh, budget. Much of that is due to the Blue Cross uh, decision and outcome. We do have a new self-funded program included in this budget that we'll speak to a little bit later that restores some of the lives that were lost, but certainly not all. Lastly, quick note on Medicare Advantage. It's been a hot topic in the state over the last few years. 
when we get our initial attribution run for Medicare, it is before open enrollment, essentially decisions are made by people who, who might choose a Medicare Advantage plan. So we have that 68,000 life initial number, but then a number of those lives before the performance year even begins will select a Medicare Advantage plan, which means we actually start the year with fewer lives. So we projected in our budget starting around 53,700 lives, and ultimately after the Medicare Advantage migration, we're starting with 54,321. So pretty close to the initial budget, but just wanted to show that that change from 68,000 total lives initially down to 54 that will actually be in the program throughout the year. And that's solely by their decision to choose a Medicare Advantage product over traditional Medicare. Next slide, please. Flowing from attribution and a product of the final total cost of care targets, uh, we have our total cost of care targets forecast. I call it a forecast because it does still move throughout the year. Many of these have dynamic elements to them. Medicare is down, uh, just an update to the target there. It looks like a big number, but it doesn't take much on the target space to really change that number. So I'd call that a somewhat ordinary change there. The blueprint amount remains the same from the initial budget, no change in that space. In Medicaid, I uh, want to note that we worked with DIVA this uh, fall and winter and decided collaboratively to consolidate the two cohorts into one target. When we first began with the Medicaid expanded population, it was a new concept for us all. So we really worked to segregate or separate, separate those two components, have a target for the traditionally attributed, target for the expanded attributed. Through time, we've gained some comfort in the data dynamics and uh, decided to consolidate into a single target. This simplifies life for us a little bit. It means we have one settlement rather than two, um, one risk corridor, so everything kind of rolls into one. So you'll see a little bit of juggling between the categories, but if you net out the Medicaid rows, there's actually an increase there, largely due to the increase in attribution. Next, Blue Cross, you can see that total cost of care leaving the accountable care space that turns to a zero. MVP is down a little bit relative to what we budgeted. Attribution came in a little bit lower than we expected there as well. And then lastly, very last row, you can see the self-funded initiative bringing about $63 million of healthcare costs back into an accountable framework. Slide, please. Fixed payments, we supplied targets to the Green Mountain Care Board previously, indicating where we, we think we can land in the fixed payment space. Uh, to go through them, each Medicare and commercial, we've projected uh, zero percent essentially because any fixed payments that we've had for either of those uh, different lines of business have been reconciled to fee for service. Our preference is, of course, a true fixed payment that does not reconcile to fee for service. We projected a 51 percent that 51 percent of the total cost of care in our contract would be converted into a fixed payment in 2023. It actually landed at 57 and a half percent, so we've exceeded that target. Um, I'll also note in, in more exciting space that we continue to discuss the possibility of a fixed payment expansion with DIVA to broaden the scope of the fixed payment arrangement uh, for Medicaid covered lives. I, I am hopeful and excited that we can get this program to land either this year or next year. Slide, please. Total risk, as you can imagine, with the absence of the Blue Cross contract, total risk is down. It was originally 36 million, now down to 26. Uh, million. The changes, um, notable changes, are really just a flow down from attribution, total cost of care. We did agree with Medicaid to a blended 3% risk corridor. So as part of the consolidation of those two cohorts is now we have one risk corridor. In the past, we had two. So that was a, a slight change. And then commercial just flows accordingly. It's always been a little bit challenging to display the uh, blueprint, SASH, advanced shared savings risk element. So I've just Put that off to the side on the right there so you can see that amount. Uh, we've discussed that much over the last couple of years, uh, certainly a complicated factor in the program, but you can see that 9.5 million off to the side there. Next slide, please. This breaks down the risk by uh, health service area. And to go through this quickly, the first two uh, columns under the leftmost two columns under the blue heading represent what we call the accountability pool. This is the way in which we incorporate primary care of all types into the risk sharing model. We segment it into non hospital PCPs, which is going to be your independence and your FQ, and then hospital F, uh, PCPs separately. 
Next column is the risk bearing entity share. That's essentially the amount the hospital takes on on behalf of the HSA beyond the accountability pool. And that results in a total risk corridor. Then we've carved off to the side the blueprint risk, advanced shared savings risk, and then have a total. I'd like to note that in the bottom row, One Care Vermont, we have now taken on $3.9 million of the blueprint risk plus an amount that we had previously obligated to St. Johnsbury and VRH community. So in total, One Care now has about $5 million of risk uh, on its balance sheet for 2023. Slide, please. Population health management expenses. Some of the elements in here we'll discuss a little bit later on as well. Um, so when we have fewer attributed lives, that generally means less uh, population health management payments going out to the network. The one care budget has been designed to float essentially with attribution as attribution grew, the budget grew accordingly as it uh, as attribution shrunk as it has this year, the expenses or payments would shrink accordingly. So we can see a number of rows that just say fewer uh, Blue Cross lives that are driving the change. There are a number of other, of other rows that say change in DIVA funding model. Your staff referenced this a little bit in the presentation on Wednesday. I'll speak to this a little bit more as we move through. I'll also speak to a, a change of the CPR program, which shows up here as $596,000 change from the initial submission and speak to that and some of the dynamics underneath. And then the new mental health screening initiative, uh, $1.6 million increase. Uh, I'll also speak to that in a few moments. I, after listening to the presentation on Wednesday, there were some questions raised by the board about the difference between these two columns. I submitted uh, yesterday a supplemental schedule that reconciles between these two columns a little bit more completely. What it does is takes the 29 million and compares it to the 26 million but adds back the DIVA money that is flowing, will be flowing to pro providers, and then also adds the amount that Blue Cross is committed or an estimate of the amount that Blue Cross is committed to providers to show that when you add all these pieces together in total, providers and particularly primary care have access to even more funding than they initially did in the first submission of the budget. I'm happy to answer questions about that slide. We didn't incorporate it here just due to the time and crunch. Um, I wouldn't mind interrupting just for one second. Um, I forgot that we have a court reporter today and to remind everyone um, that Ms. Holland is here taking um, verbatim notes. Um, Ms. Holland, if you need a break at any time before the scheduled 10 a.m., please speak up. And then for witnesses, um, you guys know this all so well, just speak as deliberately and slowly as possible because it's hard for a court reporter to get it all down. Um, but thank you. Thank you for that reminder. All right, uh, let's shift to the next slide, please. Moving into operating costs, a couple of key changes here. Certainly the 2% admin cut ordered by the Remont Care Board is going to be a factor. I'll speak to this and break it down a little bit further in a few moments. Uh, deletion of the Blue Cross contract has a couple of elements in here. Um, we have modified our evaluation strategy. Sarah Barry will speak to that. And then we have the opportunity to update the budget. So we do a, a true tip to tail review and make sure we can capture any updates that are now known through the passage of time. Uh, so you can see that we have reduced our uh, operating expenses down from 15.2 to roughly 14.8 million. Um, and in doing so, uh, complied with the 2% admin cut and also updated our budget accordingly. Next slide, please. Hospital participation fees. Uh, this was an interesting dynamic, uh, this go around. So as a reminder, the hospital participation fees fund both one care operations for fully provider funded ACO, and they also supplement PHM or population health management payments to providers in certain areas. So the dynamic that existed this uh, budget cycle was that with the absence of the Blue Cross attribution, it created essentially a, a reduced need or a reduction in the needed necessary hospital participation fees, roughly 1.6 million. The reason for this is that we aspire to deliver an aligned population health management model to providers that is agnostic of insurance coverage. So in other words, we want the exact same model in place, whether it's a Medicare attributed life, an MVP attributed life, a Medicaid attributed life, et cetera. What that means is that in some cases, the hospital participation fees are supplementing any payments we get from the payers to get the population health management payment potential up to that aligned level. 
So when the Blue Cross lives came out, all of a sudden that amount that the hospitals were supplementing above what Blue Cross contributed was would have been just naturally gone if we just let the cookie crumble, so to speak. So what we did through the budget process was evaluate uh, that dynamic relative to all of the changes made. And what we decided to do was to leave the hospital participation fees flat level with what was submitted last year and essentially reinvest the 1.6 million that would have otherwise been a hospital participation fee reduction back into population health management payments with a specific focus on supporting primary care. We'll speak to that uh, a, quite a bit more throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit and dive into some of the notable changes. These topics came up, <coughs> excuse me, through the first part of the presentation. We just wanted to go a little bit deeper and discuss each of these nuances as they're uh, quite impactful or important. First notable change, uh, the no Blue Cross contract in 2023's business. Blue Cross declined to enter into an ACO contract with us late in December. The two important impacts for me were is that we no longer have Vermont's largest insurer contributing to the all-payer model, but perhaps more importantly, it left providers with insufficient time to prepare for the financial impacts. And the, the group that in particular mattered to me the most were the CPR, Comprehensive Payment Reform participants who had been relying upon a fixed payment and to learn late in December that that was no longer going to be an option, certainly left them with a number of questions about their financial circumstance rolling into 2023. As such, we engaged with our network. We started even uh, in the week between Christmas and New Year's to convene uh, participants within the OneCare network, in particular the CPR practices, discuss different strategies moving forward, discuss what we knew, which was very little at that point in time. And that also led to the development of a self-funded initiative and this mental health screening initiative for primary care that we'll speak to in a little bit more depth later. Actually, right now, next slide, please. So in light of the uh, Blue Cross News, we collaborated with the UVM Health Network to develop an ACO program between the two organizations. This is an alternative to using a third-party administrator as an intermediary that can bring in a number of self-funded plans or ERISA plans in one swap. So it's a direct UVM HN health plan to one care ACO arrangement. In terms of its design, it's very similar to other commercial programs we've had. I can't share everything in, in public. There's some confidential elements to this. So in summary, it, it looks and feels very much like other commercial ACO arrangements one care has run in the past. There is a cost to operate this program to the hospitals of about 300,000. That comes from that exact same dynamic of supplementing the in revenue streams into one care to get up to that aligned population health management payment base. So we have the exact same financial model for the providers, regardless of whether it's a UVMHN covered life or a Medicare life. Next slide, please, thank you. CPR, apologies in advance, this is going to be a little bit complicated as it affects funds flow in an already complicated program. This, the Comprehensive Payment Reform, or CPR program, is a payer-blended fixed payment or initiative for independent primary care. Been operating this program since 2018. Historically, it included a Blue Cross fixed payment component. So in the absence of that component, not only did it mean that a portion of these practices uh, revenue was going to revert back to a fee-for-service structure. It also meant that the amount that OneCare was supplementing on top of that fee-for-service level was essentially gone without an intervention. So we engaged with the CPR practices and discussed ways to stabilize their financials, particularly as they transition from December into January and smooth that out as much as we can. We did not want any disruption for those practices. We were somewhat limited in our options, but what we ultimately decided to do was to migrate MVP attribution into the CPR financial model, even absent a fixed payment arrangement. This helped to lessen the financial drop-off for the participating practices and restore some program scope and alignment. Um, we, in the first couple of years of this program, before one, Blue Cross offered a fixed payment option, we did the same thing with the Blue, Blue Cross Live, essentially. And what we do is we calculate the CPR, we run the CPR math for all of the attribution 
but then in our payment model, accommodate the fact that some of the payments are going to go directly from MVP to the practices in the fee for service structure. So on the next slide, please. I can show this a little bit more. When we have a fixed payment option, it means that we can redirect healthcare dollars to certain parts of the healthcare system that we think are priority. Primary care naturally is one of those. So the two columns on the left, FPP stands for fixed prospective payment. We can allocate an increased amount of the Medicare and Medicaid fixed payment to primary care and facilitate that through the fixed payment arrangement itself. When we have a payer that does not offer a fixed payment arrangement, it affects the funds flow. We now have the light green bar on the right, which represents fee for service that we, and it's an estimated amount that will be paid from MVP to those participating CPR practices. But the CPR program though, pays more than fee for service. So we now have a gray box that says dues, dues is akin to participation fees that is now funded by the hospitals. So you'll see in our budget that the CPR line item has increased by about 500,000. That's a change in funds flow more than anything else. And again, I apologize for the complexity, this is a complex model here, but it, I just wanted to explain that dynamic where we really wanted to get the MVP lives back in the CPR framework, but need to do so recognizing that fee for service will still fly for those particular practices. Next slide, please. DIVA $2 million direct payments. This was discussed also on Wednesday, and I hope to uh, clarify a little bit here today. When we submitted the budget last fall, we included a $2 million unsecured revenue line related to the DIVA contract. We didn't really know what to call it. That was our best label. It was unclear at the time whether those funds would flow through OneCare, then to the providers, or be processed as payments directly from DIVA to the OneCare participants. It ultimately is the latter. DIVA will make those payments directly to the providers. This means that providers will receive some of their funds through OneCare, some from DIVA for the same initiative, and all the payments are linked in some way to outcomes-based components or something that the providers need to do in addition to their ordinary day-to-day uh, -day or the results they produce. So the revised budget reflects this change. We deleted the $2 million unsecured revenue line, that's revenue coming out, and also inserted expense offsets to the initiatives and components that DIVA will be funding. So you can see on the uh, P&L income statement that we prepared that there are some negative expenses, contra expenses, if you wanna call them that, to reflect the, the money that'll be coming right from DIVA to the practices, but as part of the One Care program. We direct DIVA, which practices to pay and when for their performance. So it's very much integrated into the OneCare program suite. The funds flow is the change. It does not affect overall provider uh, payment levels or amounts or the program design, just the funds flow. So in the um, submission I sent in last night, it, it shows that as part of the reconciliation between the initial budget and the PHM payments and what we now have in our revised budget. Next slide, please. All right, notable change number five, 2% admin cut as ordered by the Green Mountain Care Board. That amounted to approximately 304,000. Uh, because OneCare is a fully provider funded ACO, that cut results in essentially expense savings to the, to the hospitals. But uh, as I said before, we kept their participation fees flat this year. Uh, Ultimately, the, this cut results in fewer resources to support ACO activities and the participating providers, uh, which is a concern to me. And as we do every year, we update the budget tip to tail. There are other ups and downs in, but they net out to approximately 8,000. So it was pretty neutral this year. In terms of the uh, changes that we categorized under the 2% admin cut, there were five positions eliminated from the budget, totaling about 420,000 add on fringe expense savings along with those positions. Then there are other cuts, some are up, some are down, frankly, but there is a software and contracting increase or consulting rather increase. Uh, this is going to relate to our evaluation strategy that we'll come back to in a few moments. Uh, we reduced public relations expenses and then we updated for the Green Mountain Care Board bill back. So we had to make all these different moving parts come together to aggregate up to this 2% admin cut of 304,000. 
quick pause right here as we're going to transition over to Sarah Berry, who's going to cover the evaluation strategy. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everyone. For the record, this is Sarah Berry, Chief Operating Officer for One Care Vermont. So, Kelly, we can go to the next slide. Um, and in the next few minutes, I want to cover a couple of key topics that One Care has been asked to address, including uh, how we've evolved our evaluation strategy, a little bit about executive compensation, and then a fair amount of detail related to the benchmarking budget order and the progress that we've made working with the staff of the Green Mountain Care Board and our vendor over the last four or five months or so. So picking up from where Tom left off, uh, in the budget, there was an FTE originally planned for an evaluation uh, staff member to really help us systematize and be a little bit more aggressive in evaluating the impact of some of the programs and policies that we have put in place. And based on continuing conversations that OneCare had with our board of managers through the fall, we really took a step back and decided that there was a need to kind of upscale that work. We needed to have a deeper bench um, of people that we could call on to do this work, and we needed to facilitate getting to some results faster. So over the course of the winter, we engaged with our board and our board ultimately approved a strategy where we would eliminate that one FTE position and we would outreach and identify a consultancy or contractor who had expertise in complex evaluations such as we're doing in the healthcare reform space and could really aid us in that work. So uh, in that effort, we really set the goals of this evaluation work with a contractor to be focused on evaluating the effectiveness of specific One Care programs and initiatives, those that we prioritize for this current performance year, and to use the, the results from those evaluative efforts to really drive decision-making about population health investments, uh, um, strategies, policies that we may then want to adapt as we do our planning processes and ultimately are headed for the 2024 performance year. So the, the process we went through was very comprehensive. We met with many uh, evaluation firms that have um, lots of expertise. And it turns out that many of them also have contracts in the state of Vermont with various entities and therefore had either real or perceived conflicts of interest. Uh, so that took us some time to negotiate through those. We actually went pretty deep through two different rounds of conversation with different entities um, before identifying a third company that really could meet the timeline, had the bench strength, that we were looking for and didn't have those uh, specified conflicts or perceived conflicts of interest. And so I'm very happy to share that we actually signed that contract last evening. Um, we have already had some tremendous planning work underway and we are looking good to meet the timelines that we have set out with this company. So the focus of this engagement for the current performance year are really around five key pieces of work here. Uh, the first is to go deep with us and design, conduct, and report on four studies of programs that we've had underway or requirements that are set forward as well by the Green Mountain Care Board. So you'll see on the slide a focus on our comprehensive payment reform program, our care coordination program, the value-based incentive fund, this is really looking at and studying the results from last year, because as you may recall, the value-based incentive fund has now been integrated along with our care coordination program under the new population health model framework. And Dr. Wolfman will share more updates about uh, progress and that evolution and when she speaks in a little while. And then finally, there has been an open budget order over the years uh, for One Care from the Green Mountain Care Board regarded uh, regarding examining return on investment for One Care's activities. And so we um, thought that it would make much more sense to draw on national experts who could do the literature review, really look at how to design that study. Uh, and so we've embedded that as one of the key studies that needs to be completed in this engagement. And then finally, because we are under a new population health model framework that we implemented in January of this year, we asked this company to help us proactively design the study that would need to be conducted next year to start to look back at the performance and potential changes that are happening in the system this year as a result of this initiative and policy. Next slide, please. 
So with the evaluation, um, we are moving forward with a, a deeply mixed methods approach. Uh, as you can imagine, there is a lot of quantitative data that will be used. We, uh, the vendor will be looking at regression adjusted trending, benchmarking and subgroup analysis. Um, and we will be working over the next few weeks to start to get them the data under this arrangement so they can begin that process. And then in parallel, it's always important to understand the experience of providers and patients in the broader system of care. And so there will be focus groups and interviews conducted with key stakeholders. Uh, those key stakeholders are defined differently and broadly for each of those sub-studies. Next, uh, we really needed to think about the burden of engaging in evaluation activities on our providers and the, you know, the limited time and availability they have. And so one of the things we really liked about the proposal from this vendor is that they would use an integrated approach. So while each study will have its own design and results, they will take advantage of being in uh, presence of, say, care coordinators or primary care providers to ask questions that could draw out key information across several of those studies at once rather than coming back repeatedly um, and perhaps drawing on more time or pulling providers further away from patient care or other uh, obligations that they have. So that's really what I mean by the integrated timelines and methods. And so the plan is that we will have findings from those uh, first studies mentioned by September of 23. So that's the value-based incentive fund, care coordination and CPR that the return on investment study findings are anticipated in the November timeframe. And that was uh, very deliberate, recognizing that this board would expect updates uh, as part of the next budget conversation. And uh, finally, that the design of the population health model evaluation will happen before the end of the year as well. So with that, we're very excited to get started. I think this is going to yield some really interesting results. Um, and we expect fully that the results will be mixed, that there may be some areas of strength and there very likely will be areas of opportunity that emerge. And that's exactly the information that our board is asking for to help direct the decision making that they need to make around where to invest, how much to invest, um, and whether to continue or to pivot in, in varied directions around some of these programs that we have been implementing to date. So I'm going to pause before I move on to benchmarking. And uh, in the presentation by the Green Mountain Care Board staff on Wednesday, there was a reference to requesting one care uh, respond to a question around executive compensation as part of the ACO certification process. And I believe the question was really just asking us about the direct linkage between the uh, desire of the ACO or the, the necessity of the ACO to drive cost control growth and quality standards with how that relates to OneCare's corporate goals. So in that context, OneCare's board sets specific and measurable goals related to cost growth reduction and quality performance on an annual basis. And really the corporate goals are uh, represent the focus that is intended to drive change through the tools that OneCare as an ECO has available to us. So for example, through the programs or the data that we provide out into our provider network, the contracts we negotiate with payers or others, as well as the priorities and focus areas that we set. So for 2023, the corporate goals, which again, uh, the staff, displayed last week or on Wednesday, so I'm not doing it again here, but those corporate goals demonstrate a strong emphasis on advancing use of data. So advancing our data platform, evaluation of programs, our key activities represented this year, that again, drive decision-making and advancements in our investments, in our programs, and in our policies. So those are really the levers that we as a network of providers have available to us. And then quality is specifically addressed through advancements in our population health model and our work in health disparities. So for us, the corporate goals represent the incremental steps and progress that we need to make as an ACO to accomplish the longer term objectives. And uh, I think it's a nice opportunity as we continue to talk about the 
the evolution of where our programs were in 22 into 23, as well as you'll start hearing from us over the, the next few months, the increase uh, in focus for 24 and beyond. It's really a long-term strategy that needs to be deployed if we're going to shift some of these deeply held levers in the healthcare system in Vermont. So with that, Kelly, if you could move forward to the first benchmarking slide. Go ahead. Thank you. So I, I want to pause here and thank the staff to the Green Mountain Care Board for their presentation on, on Wednesday. I think they covered uh, quite a bit of detail and grounding around how the evolution from, say, late in 2021 through now um, has worked as we've worked as regulator and regulated entity to figure out how to thread the needle on creating a benchmarking process that addresses the regulatory lens as well as a provider quality driven lens of where are there opportunities to improve and, and how might we do that. And so I'm going to discuss both of those a little bit further today. So just briefly and as a reminder for anyone who perhaps wasn't able to listen in on Wednesday, uh, this winter, after our last budget process, we received some uh, updates from the Green Mountain Care Board asking for changes to the draft uh, benchmarking reports that we had first presented in the fall. And they specifically requested that we create a new comparison group. We call this the National All ACO Cohort. And then also that rather than looking at the initial report in the last fall, which looked at delivery patterns as a system compared to other high performing ACO systems demonstrating effective cost control. So looking at cost and quality underneath that, the request from the board was really to separate that out and look at each individual metric and identify possible performance um, in each metric rather than in that broader system lens. So in doing that work, um, which is reflected in the updated reporting, uh, the vendor also pulled the latest CMS data that had become available due to timing. So wanted to note for you that that data has been refreshed. It is for 2019, 2020, and 2021. And that in that refresh, uh, the population increased by about 10%. Kelly, if you could advance the slide, please. So the next question that seems to come up quite often as we discuss this is, what uh, is the comparison group? And I think this is a great example of where there is a tension between regulator and provider network on what might make sense as the possible comparison group. So just to walk you through this briefly, on the top of the, uh, the first row of the table, there have been questions about why One Care did or did not elect to use a off-the-shelf product provided by its vendor. And the very fundamental reason is that that product, while it has the name ACO in the title, does not actually look at data specifically for ACOs. It is using the national Medicare fee-for-service data set. So anyone possibly in Medicare uh, is what that product provides. And really uh, its intent from my understanding is to provide broad signals to parties that might be interested in ACO type activities. So we identified that that was really broad Medicare population level data and wouldn't get us deep enough in providing nuances and discretion that might be necessary to support the actual engagement and improvement activities. So then, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Green Mountain Care Board requested a national all ACO cohort, and that is in the new reporting that represents 513 ACOs across the country, and it represents every single possible type of ACO that might be out there. So they could be very similar to One Care or, in fact, very different. They could have upside only arrangements. They could be uh, primary care or skilled nursing facility only. It's, it's really Soup to nuts um, is what you get. And so from our perspective, that still more closely approximates a general population estimate than it does a peer group to a one care as an ACO operating in Vermont. And so there is then a third cohort, what we call the National ACO Peer Cohort. And this is the cohort that we described back in the fall. And for transparency, we continued to include in our reporting to the Green Mountain Care Board at the end of March. It is the cohort that One Care finds most helpful to think about how we can identify opportunities and drive system level change. 
And so I won't go uh, through the detail in this row again. I will just say that this was a cohort that was independently identified by the vendor, not by OneCare, as to have attributes that would seem to be reasonably similar to OneCare as an ACO. It does represent a much smaller peer group of 20 ACOs, and together they represent about 750,000 Medicare beneficiaries. So before I move on again, I think what's critical in this place is that the questions one might ask if you're a regulator or a provider network could be a bit different here. So as a regulator, you might be asking questions about the universe of what may be possible to achieve. Uh, that for me aligns with the request for independent look at metrics. On the other hand, as an ACO, we might want to know what is possible for ACOs like us. And so it arises a tension around how the data are organized and then how the data are used from those different perspectives. So I just wanted to name that. I think, frankly, it's a tension that we all have recognized since day one um, as part of this work. So moving forward, Kelly, if you could go to the next slide. Um, this is a very detailed table. I'm not going to go through it in extreme detail. What this does is categorizes all of the data uh, that you received in the reports at the end of March into broad swaths of, are these areas of strength that providers across Vermont um, are achieving good results or are they areas of opportunity? The lens first and foremost is that comparison to the ACO peer cohort. But again, for transparency, you can see there are footnotes on um, all of the areas of strength or opportunity, then aligning them to either the 90th percentile benchmark for the national cohort or the 50th percentile. So not trying to hide anything here, but again, trying to make sense of information and begin to identify how to use this to evaluate where the healthcare system in Vermont is producing high value for consumers and where there are opportunities to improve. Um, what we've learned through this process is that frankly, some of the data and some of the information is more actionable than others. Um, that's probably not surprising to those of you who spend your life uh, working with data. And I think it's important for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with some of this data to really contextualize it, to recognize that the healthcare landscape, both in Vermont and federally, is incredibly complex. And obvious causation is not going to be found simply based on comparison to benchmarks. There's a lot of nuance, there are stories, there's interpretation that then needs to go into this. Beyond that, there are plenty of studies uh, that have demonstrated that healthcare at large is a complex adaptive system. And when you push on one component, other aspects of that system react, oftentimes unpredictably. So that calls for us to innovate, but also to be cautious and be aware about what those other impacts could be. Overall, uh, we believe that these benchmarking data confirm that Vermont's providers are generally providing high quality and appropriate care. However, unsurprisingly, I think to all of us, there are statewide challenges, particularly in the areas of ED utilization and primary care. And as we know, these are large systemic issues that many stakeholders are taking on and working to address. This is not only in the domain of the ACO, but we absolutely believe that we uh, can and should be part of the solution to addressing the challenges in those areas. Finally, um, while the report itself um, uses color coding to indicate uh, one cares performance against benchmarks. So if you looked at the report, you'd see some shades of green and some shades of red. It's really important to note that, again, the local system and the context matters in the interpretation. So I wanted to point out a couple of areas that depending on how you looked at this, you may interpret to be better or worse, and the directionality is not necessarily clear. So for example, you could look at the increase in home health utilization um, and you could say that that is desirable if you are also looking at home health's effectiveness in reducing utilization of higher cost care settings. So if you are um, ensuring that through the provision of high quality home health services that individuals are not returning to the emergency department in unnecessary ways or that they are not spending more time than they need to in a skilled nursing facility. 
On the other hand, you may say that generally speaking, high post-acute care spend could be a desirable outcome if you look at inpatient rehabilitation and see that that's low and that outpatient skilled nursing facility and home health use are high. So again, I'm, I'm not wanting to go through every single possible data point here, but to explain that each one of these needs to be looked at through the lens of how the system of care is organized in Vermont and how the levers interplay in that delivery of care. So what I'd like to do now in the next few slides is just walk through transparently what a couple of our areas of strength and areas of opportunity look like compared to the peer and national benchmarks. So Kelly, if you could move to the next slide. So first, two areas of strength. Um, this graph displays Medicare beneficiary per month costs from 2019 on the left through 2020 and 2021. Just to orient everyone, because I will use the same colors and the same format across these slides, the green bar represents one care's performance. The orange bar represents uh, the peer cohort that I described, and that is the medium um, or the 50th percentile. And the blue bar on the right for each year represents the national cohort. And I will call out that in different places, we do compare ourselves to different percentiles there. So in this graph, what you'll see, if you look on the right for the 2021 performance year, OneCare um, is providing excellent cost outcomes relative to both the peer and the national ACO cohort. OneCare has costs about 8% lower than the peer cohort of 20 ACOs and just under 2% lower than that national cohort of 500 plus ACOs. Next slide, please. In the second graph, we're looking at preference sensitive or outpatient sensitive preventable admissions per 100,000. This is a composite measure. In the reports there, this is then broken out into 15 individual procedures, things like hip or knee replacements, hysterectomies, coronary artery bypass grafts. So all of that data is provided. And again, the graphs compare one care's median performance to the peer and the national cohorts. And what you will see if you look at this graph as well as the underlying data is that one care meets or exceeds the peer and national cohorts for all 15 measures when compared to the 50th percentile. And when you look at the 90th percentile, one out of every three procedures continues to uh, be above that 90th percentile benchmark. And just as a note, recall that those are calculated now independently for each one of those procedures. So it, while it's possible, it is not likely that there is an organization out there that is exceeding in all 15 of those procedures. Next slide, please. Now on to two critical areas where one cares performance is significantly below uh, the peer and national cohorts. So unsurprisingly, as I mentioned a few moments ago, um, we all know that the emergency department utilization and costs are high in Vermont. And so here you see that that is a pattern um, across the three years being studied. And it is true both on a utilization, so on a visits per thousand uh, basis, as well as on a cost basis. Next slide, please. So Unlike the prior slide where lower would be better, in this case and these graphs looking at primary care, higher bars would be better. So the first chart is looking at how many Medicare beneficiaries had a primary care visit and the second an annual well visit, um, which are defined as, as slightly different things and both measured in the report. And unfortunately, we see that both primary care utilization and the annual wellness visits are lower than we would like to see, and that that is consistent across all three of those performance years. So I think the question then becomes, what is OneCare doing about this? And if you could go to the next slide, Kelly, this is really, um, I think, an opportunity to pause and reflect a little bit that ultimately, as we have engaged in this process with our vendor um, and through conversations with the staff to the Green Mountain Care Board, it has been a useful process. Uh, there have been some um, confirmation, I would say, of things that we knew from earlier data, but there haven't been any dramatic surprises 
for us as an ACO in the data. And so when we think about those areas of opportunity I just mentioned, we actually need to look back to 2022 in One Care's history and early in the winter and spring of 22, as we were starting to look at where we needed to drive change and where we needed to incentivize that behavior, we actually identified ED utilization and reducing avoidable ED utilization and improving wellness visits as two key areas that we would incentivize in our population health model. And you will see those reflected uh, for implementation as of January 23. And Dr. Wolfman will speak more about that work in just a moment. But broadly speaking, still sticking to the lens of how benchmarking data um, has informed that, uh, that evolution or that uh, focus, what we've really done in those two key areas is first to set performance targets. Um, we did that using variation data that we had within our network. We then are gathering that data. Some of it is claims-based, some of it requires manual data collection, depending on the measure. And we report it out to every organization that it's relevant for uh, on a quarterly basis. And we transparently identify high and low performers and provide patient activation lists to really start to drive outreach um, and engagement with individuals and help to provide information about the value of preventive care, for example, or choices that could be made to avoid unnecessary utilization of the emergency department. And then what we've really focused on is different ways to disseminate that information um, through things like our health service area consultations, providing information about successes and best practices. And most recently, we've really been focused on um, a series of webinars that are calling out high performers within OneCare's network, asking them to come present, what is it that they're doing? What are the workflows they have in place or the strategies that have allowed them to excel in those areas? And so you would see in the call out box in March, that peer-to-peer -peer learning process really focused on the wellness visits, um, focused on three different organizations from across the state and described some of the, the strategies that they've put in place, such as prioritizing a culture of wellness from the moment somebody engages with a, the practice and say walks in the door or has a, a virtual visit um, through their engagement with their healthcare provider and also in follow-up. And so uh, we are working directly with our providers through these various mechanisms to improve performance in these critical areas. And we are also engaging with other ACOs. And so one of the open questions for us to address is, okay, if we understand that there are other ACOs out there that are maximizing performance, how can OneCare engage with them? Our vendor provides us with the names of those organizations, and we have been reaching out to have conversations with those high-performing organizations around a focused discussion and to ask them, you know, what are they doing differently? So um, without providing you uh, necessarily the name of the specific ACO, I will tell you in a recent conversation with a high-performing ACO around uh, reducing avoidable ED utilization, uh, they first noted for us that this is a particularly challenging topic in rural environments, uh, that there are constraints that are different in terms of access to services and the way those services are organized in rural settings that might be quite different than urban or suburban settings. And then they really described processes where they looked for specific drivers of EDU. So they went deep in the data. And one of the examples they provided us is they looked at uh, urinary tract infections and why were so many people coming to the emergency department for those UTIs. And they identified that they really had uh, issues that they needed to address with the providers um, as well as with uh, patients or with consumers of healthcare services. And so their focus from a provider lens was really on how do we standardize some protocols um, around how you actually effectively treat patients that might have a UTI and, and what setting can that be done? And then they also focused on patient education and activation information. So things like putting posters up in a primary care office to remind patients that they could call the doctor's office rather than go to the emergency department and that perhaps that could be addressed over the phone or in another facilitated process. 
So ultimately for us, what we identified is that there's not a, a brilliant, you know, kind of new intervention that needs to be put in place, that there are lots of small changes that need to be made. Those changes take time and they take focused energy and they really wrap around behavioral changes, behavioral changes and system changes for providers as well as for consumers of healthcare. So I know I've covered a lot of information. Um, when we get there, I'd be happy to back up and answer questions. But before that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Wolfman to describe a little bit more about the key actions that we've been focused on through our PHM program and some of the data that we've been seeing. Um, Dr. Wolfman, before you start, um, I'm getting a few notes that folks can't see your slides. Um, I can, but I guess some folks that are um, in the public cannot. So I'll just point out to the public that the slides um, are available on our website. If you go to ACO Oversight and then Fiscal Year 23 and One Care, the slides will be posted there. Um, and for the One Care folks, I don't know. I doubt there's anything you can do in the middle of it. Um, I don't know if there's anyone on the technical end that can do it, but I don't want to interrupt this um, so folks can get them on the website if they're unable to see them. Thank you. Chair Foster, would you like us to stop screen share and? Refresh it to see if that makes a difference. I, I, um, we might as well give that a try. I mean, I can see them perfectly fine, and I think the board can. They must be able to. Yeah, we'll just give board. it a quick try. Okay, thank you. And it, Chair Foster, this is Susan Barrett. They are available also under the uh, um, today's board meeting materials, um, right on our landing page for for the Green Mountain Care Board website. Maybe it would be sorry, possible the, if people could ahead, just call out the slide number they're on so the public can follow along that way too. Great. So we just finished slide 29, and I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Wolfman. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Carrie Wolfman. I am the CMO at One Care Vermont. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this uh, again is slide 30. Uh, Sarah just presented what we're doing in 2023 regarding an evaluation strategy. And what I would like to do right now is just pivot to a couple of slides to update you for your awareness on surveys that have taken place in 21 and 22 um, so that we could evaluate our work. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna go into lots of detail regarding the table at the left here, but we put this here for your awareness. Oh, that is not the slide. There we go, thank you. Put this here for your awareness, just to show you that we have done a lot of surveying of our network over the past couple of years. We can come back to detail about some of these uh, in the future if desired. And I will be touching on a couple of these, especially the one uh, at the bottom in a future slide today. I'd like to draw your attention to the right-hand side of this slide and tell you that we did do a very small qualitative uh, verbal survey, an interview survey. This involved uh, Dr. Jacobs, who is in the Family Medicine Department at UVM. I was involved and Dr. Congiano. We wanted to study how well faculty family medicine physicians understand value-based care work and its impact on their own work, as well as an understanding of ACOs. So our target population for this small uh, verbal survey was the academic family medicine physicians. This was again qualitative and we, re we recorded the um, virtual interviews and then transcribed and coded the responses. The findings are uh, what I really want you to uh, pay attention to here. And that, those were that family medicine physicians do understand value-based care. In fact, the younger and more recently trained family physicians only know really value-based care as the way to practice. Um, and all of the family medicine docs that we interviewed are looking forward to further evolving their team-based care teams. And um, the takeaway here at the bottom is that they really do not understand ACOs. So those are the key findings of that um, short but very important uh, qualitative study that we did present at the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine Conference in Savannah in September. This drew some really interesting conversation and others around the country said that they were finding the same when they interviewed their providers. 
Next slide, please. Our value-based care team did partner last year with the Larner College of Medicine research team to develop a survey tool so that we could interview and survey our providers across the network. A literature review was done by this research team and they found no existing provider survey that we could utilize. So we had to build a survey in REDCap to use. The team based this on technology, uh, a technology acceptance model and they based it on two themes. One was ease of use and the other was perceived usefulness. So again, this model really um, is one that evaluates how people utilize IT, information technology, and we applied that to how our providers utilize One Care Vermont. We got a very low response rate, unfortunately. It was difficult to disseminate the survey. We got a 7.6% completion rate. And the most common response was neither agree nor disagree, making us believe that perhaps there's a lack of understanding of the ACO or poor question choice. There were 25 questions on this survey. So the key findings were that for usefulness theme, the usefulness theme, the highest correlations were with the, from those who are rewarded for good outcomes, who believe they're rewarded for good outcomes, those who um, have an ACL membership by choice, and um, those who have a higher percent of patients in the ACO. For the ease of use theme, the opposite pattern was observed. These results were considered by the research team to be valid, but we also agreed that they were minimally actionable, partly due to the low response rate. One of the most important or interesting findings was that independent practice respondents were more than twice as likely to report that they understand one care. So over on the right of this slide, key takeaways and next steps. Respondents awful, often lack an understanding of one care. One care remains dedicated to surveying a broad group of stakeholders to improve its work. Survey mechanics are challenging. It was difficult to put this together. Balancing qualitative and quantitative analyses is optimal. And we believe that we can better centralize and coordinate survey approaches and evaluations as we are planning to do uh, this year, as Sarah already shared. We will be rebooting this survey and sending it out again in June uh, or July. And what we will do this time is survey not just providers, but lots of other types of members. So when we say providers, loosely we mean um, two different things. So we have clinical providers and we have providers who are part of the ACO network. We want to interview a broader range of providers to include administrative people, managers, um, quality managers, others who are involved with the ACO so that we have a broader um, uh, feedback on the um, use of the ACO. Next slide, please. You asked that we give you more detail and an update on our population health model. So I'm going to turn to that next. Next slide, please. So just to go through sort of a definition or um, explanation of how the population health model works for 2023. We blended the base, the care coordination payments and the bonus funding streams for purposes of promoting clarity, simplification and efficiencies this year. So this really marries care coordination and quality improvement activities. It rewards teamwork and practices and across the care continuum at the local level. And it drives work on identified priority areas for both quality improvement and cost reduction. Next slide, please. Again, the PHM is not new. It is a blend of activities that have been going on for the past couple of years. The metrics for 2023 for the population health model are listed in this table. So what there's a lot more information that was in this table originally, but we tried to simplify it. And I know it's a lot, I'm not going through all of the numbers here. 
but the metrics are in the left-hand column. There are basically six. So the three at the bottom are all diabetes metrics um, separated out per payer. The third column over shows the baseline performance. The colored column is comparison performance for the first quarter. And then the target is in the right-hand column. So as you can see by the boxes that are green, targets are being met for basically three metrics, the child and adolescent well visits and developmental screening, and the diabetes metrics across all payers. You may have some questions about this later, but I'm not going to um, pause here and uh, go over the particular numbers. Um, you may have some questions about how we set the targets, which we can come back to later. Next slide, please. The way that we are driving improvement in these clinical areas is to work at the local level with the population health value-based care teams. And what we are doing this year is rounding twice, once in the spring and once in the fall. We just finished our spring rounding, which we completed, uh, thanks to a very hardworking value-based care team at OneCare. We, we put all of these into about a five-week period. And so I wanna give you some results of that. We met with all 14 HSAs starting March 27th, and just finished. We expanded our invitee list this year. For the first time, it wasn't just hospital-based um, leaders that were invited to these consultations, which we are also now calling conversations. We also invited leaders from independent uh, and employed primary care, the area agencies on aging, the home health agencies, the designated agencies, blueprint, hospitals, et cetera, there were some other ent entities also represented. The leaders who were invited and the audience included key executive, operational, and clinical contacts. And the average attendance rate was 11 leaders per consultation. So that's not counting those of us from OneCare who attended. If we count everyone, it was about 25 people per session who came to a virtual meeting. We did perform the first one in person at St. Johnsbury and we're hoping to um, go in person to many more of these for the fall rounding. At the end of each of these conversations, we did do a real-time survey to analyze the content, the purpose, the information that we shared, the data, the analytics that we shared to see if it was useful to them, if, it was, if we were giving them what they wanted. And 94% of the respondents found that the consultations were insightful to them. Next slide, please. So again, this is just the first quarter. We didn't want to give you specific numbers um, because we can see trends, but we're not going to see the real outcomes of this work till later in the year. But I wanted to just tell you what uh, some of the findings were in this initial spring rounding. Randolph um, is the only HSA right now meeting the initial hypertension follow-up metric. The Rutland HSA is increasing Medicaid expanded primary care engagement and at the same time lowering spend rate in that same group. Maybe there's a correlation, maybe not, but that was interesting. Springfield is increasing their primary care engagement in a meaningful way and also reducing emergency department utilization, increasing well visits. Bennington is reducing readmissions significantly. They are increasing team-based care and able to show that and also showed some interesting data on how they are increasing both the documentation and the uh, completion of colorectal cancer screening. The Newport HSA has established daily care coordination rounding in primary care and has also shown meaningful change in their control of diabetes. And St. Johnsbury is working on reducing avoidable ED visits and um, is meeting stretch goals, not just target, but stretch goals in the diabetes control metric. So it's been really meaningful uh, conversation that we've had at these meetings where people can share the work they're doing. We have peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Uh, we're sharing best practices. We are accumulating these takeaways so that we can then go back to them, find out what their methods are, um, be prepared to share that to other HSAs in the future. Next slide, please. 
The accountabilities for our population, population health model are represented here for this year. So there is a required triannual care coordination reporting. Teams have to be willing to undergo a timely response to any audits. And as you know, we incorporated care coordination requirements and accountabilities into the quality work in the population health model. So the HSA um, teams have to meet care coordination accountabilities to unlock any of the funds in the population health model. So the accountabilities include ongoing work with populations of focus, which include these groups that are listed here, high medical and social risk, high utilizers of the emergency department, those with a, a high total cost of care, and those with high inpatient use or utilization. The population health teams must also engage in ongoing process improvement plans if they are not meeting these care coordination targets. So this is an ongoing process. Our teams meet with the local teams at least once a quarter, more often once a month. Next slide, please. This is just a sample, but I wanted you to see what we are now showing when we have these HSA level conversations. It's really the first time that we have sort of shown um, various organizations uh, within an HSA how everyone is performing together. So it's, it's driving a little bit of what I would call competition for the first time. So they're able to see where they stand compared to the other organizations in their HSA. They can compare that um, in the second row from the bottom to the one care total. And then they can see their health service area rank um, at the bottom. So for this particular HSA, for example, they might say, oh, we're second for the age 40 plus annual wellness visits, but we are 10th when it comes to diabetes control. This information is also available on our portal for our members. And there is the ability to drill down all the way to the provider level. So I can go to my own patient list and see which of my patients by name are not meeting targets. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we wanted to survey in real time whether or not these conversations and consultations were meaningful uh, to our network. So we asked them just to, in um, real time at the end, took about two minutes to answer eight questions uh, regarding engagement. And we were very pleased with the results. So um, on this slide, it just shows that um, the majority of those who took the survey at the end thought that the data that we presented uh, regarding health disparities was insightful. And by the way, 155 people took the survey. Um, I'm sorry, 155 people attended and 103 took the survey. So we had about a 66% response rate to this real-time survey. So even though there was um, positive feedback on what we shared regarding health disparities, there were comments added that they want more information in this area, which is part of our plan for the fall rounding. Next slide, please. When it came to how effective we as a One Care team were at achieving our goal of creating a space for collaboration, again, the majority uh, of people thought that this was a meaningful way to collaborate and found it helpful. They did make a comment that we uh, need to continue working on ways to um, both receive, request and receive their feedback. Next slide, please. So related work and next steps. I have shared with you already that we will be rounding again in the fall. We are having local meetings monthly to quarterly. We are having quarterly quality webinars. The first has already taken place and the second is planned for June. The first 
was about um, primary care engagement and wellness, I'm sorry, yes, wellness visits. And it included a solo practice, an FQHC, and a pediatric practice who were high performing. So they came to this webinar and presented their successes um, and shared their learnings. The June webinar will be about ED utilization. So we will um, reach out, we will find those who are highest performing when it comes to ED utilization and ask them to share their successes and their methods. We will also be reaching out to low performing participants, those who are, for example, not meeting the care coordination requirements. Right now, there are about, only about two practices, I believe, that are not meeting that, but we will keep a close eye on that. We want everyone to be able to succeed. So our goals are not only to sort of uh, share best practices from those that are doing well, but to identify those who need extra help. We will supply them with IT support. We will help them utilize our patient prioritization app so they can obtain their list of patients who are not meeting the goals and work on panel management in that way. We are already involved and um, just about complete with establishing our 2024 metrics and our policy regarding those metrics. These will include added accountabilities, which we can share with you in the future. Next slide, please. So now I would like to just switch gears slightly. This is the last slide, and it is regarding the notable change number seven in Tom's list of seven notable changes for this budget revision. And this is information about the mental health screening initiative for primary care. One Care is offering a one-time mental health screening initiative this year only of $1.6 million total that will be handed out in two different payment installments to primary care groups that are participating. The first payment is due to go out very soon, I think in a couple of weeks, and that will go to those practices who implement or already have a protocol to administer depression and suicide screening for patients age 12 and older, and also to report those results electronically. Participants who are already screening must give us a year in 2022 baseline report electronically. Participants must document and track screening and also follow up. Starting in July, we want them to document their follow up for any positive screens. And again, we're requesting that this is electronic and they need to give us those reports. Qualifying primary care practices must report their progress back to us in the latter half of the year so we can prepare to pay out hopefully all of the money by the end of the year in December to those who met payment number one requirements and then who electric, electronically uh, report their results to us. Just to note, we are not measuring their rate of improvement for this year. We want to establish a process of more complete screening for depression, suicide, and then documentation of follow-up. So that is the last slide. I just want to um, say that the notable budget changes that we have presented today compel us to further support primary care and mental health care for Vermonters, to further promote cost and quality accountabilities via benchmarking and evaluations, and to continue providing tools and financial models that are needed by our network to deliver high quality, affordable health care in the right place at the right time. Thank you for your support and for listening to our updates today. And we are available for your questions. Great, thank you all very much. Um, we'll, we'll take a break. Um, why don't we go take 15 minutes? We'll come back at 1010. Okay, uh, Ms. Holland, are you all set? I'm ready. Great, okay. And again, if you need a break while we're going, just flag me. Um, of course, we'll go back on the record um, and we'll turn to board member comments and questions and we'll start with um, member Holmes. Okay, great, thank you. And Owen, I'm not sure if I'm the only one, but your camera is not on for me, but maybe oh. it's fine for everybody else. Oh, there, how's that? There you are, okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, so, 
happy to start. Thank you so much um, to the ACO team for the presentation. I think there was a lot of uh, clarity on some of the issues that we raised at the last meeting. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the new vendors evaluation results next fall. I, you know, that, that'll be exciting. Hopefully it will guide programmatic decision making in the future and be very interesting and informative for all of us to see. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, I think the first is pretty high level, but as I look at uh, the operating expenses per attributed life, um, you know, we can see that with the loss of the Blue Cross Blue Shield lives, that has risen substantially. If we look at our staff's analysis, it's now higher than it was in 2020, 2021, 2022. So that's an unfortunate loss in efficiencies. So I'm, my first question really is, what is your ideal or your target ratio of operating expense per attributed life? And how does your ratio compare to high performing ACOs in your chosen peer group? I can take a stab at that one, Tom Boris again. Um, in terms of how it compares to other ACOs, that's a great question. One we haven't had time to delve in, but with some of the other partnerships or discussions we're having with other ACOs, I think there's opportunity there to uh, compare or evaluate our operating expenses relative to other organizations. You know, in thinking about this, it is a, an unfortunate dynamic that with the loss of attri attributed lives, the same kind of infrastructure, when you do that ratio, just it's going to bounce up in terms of operating costs per attributed life. We thought about this quite a bit. A couple dynamics I think are important to note. One is one cares operating expense uh, structure is largely fixed costs. There's a couple of components that move with attribution, but it's really designed to be a base upon which these ACO programs can be built and operated. The other dynamic that's important to note as well is uh, by adding back in the self-funded contract, at least from the ACO infrastructure standpoint, there's a very comparable amount of work, even though there are fewer attributed lives. So that contract kind of backfills any operational savings that you might expect, otherwise expect to occur. And then the third point I think that's just important to note is that we just need a certain level of stability in our operating expense base to continue through time. Attribution will go up and down through the years, you add a program, lose a program, and we need to maintain a certain level of infrastructure just to keep what we have built up and running. So it is a dynamic that panned out because of the, the loss of attribution. Uh, and we continue as always to really look closely and hard at our operating expenses and the cost borne to the hospitals. I think it'd be really helpful to, as you're um, delving more closely into what other ACOs are doing and doing this benchmarking to really get a sense of that infrastructure, that fixed cost, and what does that look like in other similarly you know, situated ACOs? And, and to the degree that you can share that with us, that would be extremely helpful. Um, okay. Uh, my second, actually, my second question is much more in the weeds, but in some ways, some of these questions are going to come in the order of the slides. So my second question was around, it was on slide 10, and I noticed you were spending about $50,000 on advertising, recognizing that's down from over 100 in your initial budget. But I actually, it, it piqued my curiosity because I'm wondering who your target audience is and, and, and what you're trying to sell or what message you're trying to share or where that, who are you advertising to? I can first start with the label. It's a, the advertising label is more of an accounting chart of accounts kind of bucket that we put these funds uh, into. Um, in terms of our approach through public relations, it's not so much advertising or marketing for market share or anything of that nature. It's to really explain uh, to the public, to you folks, the legislature, uh, anybody who's interested, frankly, in what uh, One Care does. So it's really there to help spread the story. We talked a little bit about challenging challenges, getting participants and the public to understand what an ACO is. So we do invest some time and energy in that work over time. Um, prior iterations of this board have asked us to do more of that. And we're actually based on new instruction or guidance, starting to taper that down a little uh, through time. But I do think that there's still a need to continue telling the story so that there's a greater level of understanding about what we're trying to do here as an ACO operating in Vermont. So it's 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 expenditures. I mean, is it, um, I would just love to know, is it, uh, you know, internet advertising is or marketing or is it lobbying efforts or is it, advertising in in print form or what would be included in that message delivery 
or is it just the time it takes to, you know, to have PR individuals reaching out? I'm just, I'm trying to understand of what, how that's manifesting yep. itself in the budget. Sorry, just pulling it up here for the, the main sure. uh, expenses in that category include our website maintenance, which is a pretty significant expense to maintain the website. We have uh, another amount for Vermont Digger, where we post press releases or things of the like. We also have expenses related to some social media platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter, where we try to keep our message uh, in the forefront for the community. So it's a, it's an amalgam of a number of small expenses that add up to that particular row. Okay. Um, my next question actually was about, um, and I may come back to some of the provider understanding of one care. I think that was later in the slides. So my, my order is a little bit in the slides here, my notes. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, mental health, the screening and the follow-up initiative. Uh, significant resources being devoted to this program, you know, $1.6 million. And I'm wondering about the design of the program in the sense that was the program designed based on evidence that providers in your network were either one, not already screening for depression and suicide risk, suicide ideation, or two, screening but not following up. I'm, I'm trying to understand what specific problem the incentive structure is trying to solve. Recognizing there's fully, you know, there is a mental health crisis, but the incentives are to increase screening and increase follow-up. So I'm wondering if you're finding that providers are not already doing both of those things. I'm happy to take that um, first. Um, I agree with what you already said. Um, I agree that screening is occurring. Um, the conversations we had in our Population Health Strategy Committee around this initiative had to do with the fact that um, we are not able to capture the true amount of screening that is occurring for either depression or suicide electronically at this point in time. It is and remains an annual quality metric, but it's a manual abstract, manually abstracted metric. Uh, we want to drive uh, and increase, obviously, in the screening, but also drive a recording of the screening and a tracking method to discover where we may have um, a problem with lack of follow-up, lack of referral and follow-up. So it's a it's a multi-pronged initiative. Um, more screening needs to occur. Certainly more suicide screening needs to occur. We would like the standard screens that are being used to be recorded in digital fields so we can actually run a true report of the re results and the work that's being done. And then we'll have a better picture about where to drive change. Um, so it's all of those. And is there any, um, are there any steps or support that One Care can provide as we increase screening and increase the need for referrals to more mental health clinicians and still face a shortage of those mental health clinicians, is there anything that One Care can do to help the providers in their network when they now have referrals that can't be met um, because of our shortage in that, in that realm? What, what happens with that? Well, I think that answer is also multi-fold. Um, we are driving, um, care coordination activities, care management activities. So um, there, there's input from the blueprint for behavioral therapist support in our primary care clinics. We are incentivizing the independent practices in our CPR program to integrate mental health into their primary care medical homes. And not all mental health counseling, behavioral therapy comes from a, what we think of as psychiatry, um, primary care, practitioners provide a lot of that. So the follow-up can be a referral to a DA, it could be a referral to a private psychotherapist, but it also might be a follow-up, uh, a more appropriate follow-up within the primary care home. So we're um, incentivizing primary care to do more work also in the medical home regarding mental health care. Okay. Sounds, I mean, I'm really optimistic. I hope this works. I know it's a one-time, you know, uh, program, but I'm optimistic that this will make some inroads in, in what we're seeing as a, as a true crisis in our state nationally as well. Um, on slide 25, there was uh, the benchmarking comparison with respect to per member per month Medicare costs between 
One Care and both the national ACOs and the peer ACOs. And one of the things that I noticed was that the the advantage that One Care of Vermont or Vermont has seen in its relative costs of care seems to be shrinking. So that if you look at between you know 2019 and 2021, One Care's PMPM spending stayed the same, while both the national cohort and the ACO peer cohort saw a decline in spend. So I'm wondering if you have dug into that to see why our spending advantage seems to be declining. Uh, thanks for the question. This is Sarah Barry for the record. Um, we've noted it as well. Uh, it's an area that we're curious about. I think that you know we're challenged a little bit by the confounding impact of different states and regions responses to the COVID pandemic. And that is making any sort of kind of causal comparison very difficult um, in this space. So we've noted it here. We've noted it in the trend as well with the annual well visits um, as something that you know, maybe it is moving in the wrong direction. What we haven't identified is a pinpoint kind of laser focused reason that just says change this one or two, you know, critical levers and, and you'll switch the direction. I think to my earlier point, what we're hearing as we talk with other high performing ACOs around the country is that it's the it's the amalgamation, it's the combination of years of many different strategies and frankly, laser focus. And I think that's part of what we are learning at OneCare is, you know, in the early years of the all payer model, we were very focused on scale. We were very focused on innovation and testing lots of different things out. And the cost of that in part was a lack of simplification and focus. And that's really what we as an ACO are trying to drive through things like Dr. Wolfman's description of PHM. So a lot more to come. I think you know one of the areas we would love help in and support through the broader healthcare system is what are the key questions that this raises and you know where can one care through its role, not as a you know data analytics vendor in general to the to the state, but where can we in our role ask deeper questions, try to understand the interplay of levers, and then where we can derive impact. Actually, that's a, that's a good segue to my, my follow-up question, which is around you know the relatively high ED utilization, the high ED costs, low PC visits, you know wellness visits relative to our peer ACOs is alarming. Um, and I, the key strategy, it seems to be, if I understand correctly, seems to be to be setting some performance targets and then sharing data, sharing information with your provider network about high utilizers, about best practices, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, posters in in uh, in practices to to address for patients. But that seems like an information strategy. And I guess what I'm curious about, is do you believe that the root cause of high ED utilization and low PC you know, pr primary care access is because of a lack of data or understanding or information that that's gonna solve? Or is there some other systemic problem that needs to be addressed that information flow and data is really not going to address it? So will an information-based strategy actually address the root cause of you know, our high ED utilization and, and primary care utilization? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's a really important one. And just to clarify, we certainly do have some strategies that are focused on awareness building uh, and frankly, using some traditional levers and quality improvement around, you know, setting up some pure competition, uh, growing that awareness. In one example that I gave earlier, just to clarify, we do not have any specific strategies around patient education right now. That was an example from a high okay, performing really ACO. Other, high performing. Yeah. Um, okay. But to your broader question, I do think this issue is much more complex. It's a cultural issue in Vermont around people's preferences for where they receive care. It's an access issue. Um, it's about how far people have to travel and whether they can get, you know, uh, care providers, or they can get that transportation to that site of care. So in that sense, I think that the, that we are doing a lot. We are trying to focus on, you know, high risk, high utilizing individuals and being proactive in supporting those out in the community to identify specific opportunities. So, you know, this story might be a couple of years old, but one I recall from a, a primary care provider, um, uh, in Franklin County was that she was shocked to learn she had a patient 
that had visited the ED 53 times that year. And when they got to the root cause of what was going on, it was food insecurity, right? So those things matter. And our job is to use that data to drive that awareness and the opportunity, both at that individual interaction, right, between a, a patient or a consumer of healthcare services and their healthcare team, as well as to think more broadly in the system of care. And so in that broader system, you know, we're really looking as an ACO for opportunities to partner and collaborate with others because this is it's the challenge of our lifetime, I think, to really turn the dial and focus more on prevention and making sure that those social supports are in place and uh, therefore driving, you know, utilization to appropriate settings and hopefully cost down with it. Could I just tag on to that? This is Carrie Wolfman. Um, exactly what you said, Sarah. And also um, through our care management care coordination program, we are using patient prioritization information uh, and lists, basically run lists um, to identify those who are high ED utilizers. Um, and so for example, the rate of that population that had care management in 21 was 14.8% and in 22, it went up to 16.4%. So if we can ramp up the care coordination services that we can inspire and offer to individuals who are overusing the ED, who are admitted to the hospital too frequently, who cost a lot, then we can hone in on their needs. And then if we also overlay that with the information we can provide on health disparities, we can do even more identification of those who need extra services. So Dr. Wolfman, what would be your target uh, proportion of high utilizers that are in a care management? So it went from 14 to 16. At what level do you think we'd actually see significant change in ED utilization? What percentage of the, that population should be in a care management program and how do we get there? That is a great question. I don't have a set number in my mind. More is better. What we're doing now, instead of setting a target, you know, we used to have, oh, let's care manage 15% of the high and very high risk patients. What we are uh, requiring now is just show rate of improvement of manage care managing these different categories, these um, populations of focus, we call them. Ideally, 100%, you know, if you want to be idealistic. But in reality, you know, if we can go from 16.4%, you know, up to 25%. That would make a huge impact, not only on the care for those people, but the cost to the system. So, and maybe this is my next follow-up question. I know you have this accountability, um, and when practices don't reach those targets around some of those issues around utilization of EDs and, and other sorts of metrics, I know that you had a slide on, there was a requirement to engage in a performance improvement plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I heard you say that there were only two is that, is that right that you said only two practices were at that level? So does that, if, if that's right, is that right? I guess I should ask. There's only two practices that are actually um, in the stage of having to do performance improvement plans because of their uh, it's. I did outcomes. say that, and, and I may have not said it uh, in a way to be understood, but those there are a couple that have not complied with the reporting that is required at this stage in the game. It's not that only two are not meeting metrics that we have set in place. So we have to bring them along. They have to they have to be engaged in care management. They have to meet our requirements and hopefully by holding them accountable to that, they will then be performing the work in the field that we need to see happen to improve these numbers. Ah, so, so we're what keeping actually, what I mean. Yeah, so what proportion of practices are not meeting standards then, would you say? What I know is that right now, um, I, I can't specifically tell you for the ED metric, but for the six metrics in the population health model, only about 47% are meeting the targets in quarter one. So quarter two, hopefully, you know, more will. And by the end of the year, hopefully most. Got it. All right. I love your optimism. Cool. I will share your optimism. Um, Really interesting. This is all very interesting to me. Um, I, I guess my lap, my sort of, my, and then I'm gonna let other people go because I know I've been asking a lot of questions. But I, the provider survey results were a bit disheartening. You know, the very, very low response rate. Um, 
I think it's also, you know, this, maybe this goes back to the messaging, uh, but it uh, it is concerning that um, providers don't have an understanding about one care and what, you know, what you're trying to achieve. And I'm wondering, and it seemed like it was the results of the usefulness uh, were correlated with whether the provider was an ACO member by choice, um, also correlated with whether the provider was an independent or a hospital employed provider. So I'm wondering what specific strategies you are undertaking to, to ensure that hospital employed providers specifically, you know, on the ground, boots on the ground, understand the goals of, of one care, understand are responding to the financial incentives that you're putting in place, responding to the programming efforts, it's trickling down, is it getting to the providers boots on the ground? So wondering what strategies you're you're taking to do that. This is Sarah. I can address that a little bit. Um, as we've alluded to in a couple of points throughout this discussion, we are working on ways to systematically increase provider accountabilities for being in the ACO. And we recognize we need to do that along a, a pathway or a trajectory because those that maybe are underperforming, we can't necessarily expect to go from zero to 100 all at once. Uh, but what we're working towards are some expectations that will go out in contracts this summer around provider accountabilities. This will be part of that strategic planning process. And so I don't want to get in ahead of the details, but within that space, we're definitely considering, you know, are there some simple cost-effective strategies where key messages about the importance of value-based care the and how it can drive improved outcomes for patients can get to individual providers. So really trying to think about that and think about the fact that, you know, we've got about 5,000 providers. Um, it's not as easy as, you know, an, an email blast, for example. People aren't necessarily going to respond to that. So really trying to find simple, inexpensive, impactful ways to spread the message. And if I can add to that, in the finance space, what we're trying to do in reporting space as well is when we have a performance outcomes and evaluation going down to the practice site level rather than staying at the TIN level. So in other words, a hospital that may have you know five primary care sites, we report on their population health outcomes and make payments it's indicated that this was for this specific practice site, and maybe this one is meeting the metrics, but this one over here isn't, and providing more information to these uh, hospitals that would help them dig in a little bit further rather than having just one aggregate result. Okay, great, thank you. I will turn it back over to you, to Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go to Dr. Merman next. Hey, I just want to make sure you guys can hear me. Sometimes when I use my good headphones, it doesn't work well. I, um, thanks everyone for the presentations. I feel like I, I, uh, I feel like I really got a, a pretty good understanding of 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 what's been going on with the budget resubmission and what your activities have been recently and where things are going. And I really appreciate um, all the presentations today. Uh, you know, I I appreciate Vicky's comments. You know, best care, right time, right place. I actually even like carries subtle variation on that, which is high quality, affordable health care in the right place at the right time. And I I think we kind of all are on the same page in agreement. And I think it's a really nice basis to sort of frame frame this broader conversation. Um, just real quick, actually, on the, the prior topic uh, that, that Jess had just brought up, I just want to throw in my two cents on this, which is I think for a, um, a, a hospital employed provider, someone like myself, um, we don't really know what one care is, but I don't know if that's a problem. As long as the hospital is aligned with one care, whether or not as a provider, I'm being encouraged or incentivized to do specific things because of it being a one care priority or an organizational priority, I think matters a little less. And and I, I would say my colleagues, like friends from residency or through the years that work in fee for service groups that you know that are private practice groups, they know what each payer pays. They know what every all the RVUs that are generated from from various things because that that affects their day to day lives. And I can see that much more in an independent practice where an independent practice would be much more attuned to one cares incentives versus, say, like a hospital based practice, as long as the hospital organizational structure is aligned, you know, you're working with them and aligning them. To me, it's not surprising that they 
you know, or an FQHC, for instance, would would know the specific one care role in um, in why they're doing what they're doing and why they're being incentivized in a certain way. I, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, but that's just sort of a, a reflection from the last conversation. I will comment since I'm a primary care provider that is hospital employed. I would agree with what you just said. What I think is more important is that I know what the quality metrics are that we're striving to attain across the HSA. And I think it is more important that leaders from the hospital, the independent primary care practices and all those other continuum of care partners work together on the metrics that we've established. Whether they know that those metrics are coming from the ACO or not is not as important to me as teamwork and trying to, to work on the same things together at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I, I too took lots of lots of notes and, uh, and so they're somewhat slide oriented and Tom went first and so I just want to sort of uh, comment on a few things, which is I really appreciate the, the hard work that you uh, you and your team and your organization have put into trying to stabilize the CPR payments. We hear over and over again at the primary care advisory group uh, and um, and other contexts the importance of the CPR payments to independent primary practice, care practices specifically, um, and to try to also bring in uh, and make up for the gap from Blue Cross Blue Shield leaving one care with uh, self-insured plans to try to get more attributed patients into value-based uh, payment programs. So I just want to sort of really acknowledge that. I'm sure that was um, sort of a, a lot of complex work over a holiday period of time in January when there's a lot of other moving pieces. So I think that that um, I, th I think the board really appreciates those things. Um, I also want to sort of call out calling out um, and the importance uh, that was on, on calling out high performing organizations within the one care network and learning from those organizations. And I think that that is a really great way to leverage the size of a network um, that that one care has. Um, uh, and so I, I just I think that's really important. And I, and I, I, I kind of think that we could even expand on that. Tom, were you going to say something? No, sorry. Um, I think, you know, even expanding on that, I think of, uh, you know, myself as an emergency provider, um, you know, trying to understand since since ED utilization and cost is sort of the, you know, sitting out there as as an area of improvement for uh, the One Care Network, for Vermont, uh, for our region, for our country, um, that trying to also try to dive down uh, in a more um, granular analysis of, of why those costs are high in certain HSA. Is it that the utilization is high? Is it the cost per patient is high? Is it there's ex, you know more testing than other areas and trying to identify high performing organizations and 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 learn from them? So I, I really appreciate that approach of 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 doing that. Um, um, I also I, I'm I'm all appreciation here. So I also appreciate the. Uh, uh, I have some questions too. I also appreciate the uh, the Sarah. You mentioned the developing a prospective analysis for care coordination efforts, CPR programs, ROI, and value based funds. I think that that's a really important thing to then track over time and and just to to analyze and to figure out how we can improve our system. So I, I think that's a a really strong effort. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about and ask some questions about e utilization, or maybe I don't know if I'm asking questions or giving my opinion more, but uh, my question, I guess, is, and I, I, I'm trying to think. I've been trying to think about this uh, a lot uh, over the years. Is um, why people come to the emergency department, and if we're talking about high utilization, I think we really need to think about this in detail, and, and maybe having some other forum to talk about this as opposed to a budget hearing is appropriate. But um, the uh, um, I think it's helpful to use a data-based approach and talk with your peers and see this, you know, certain element of UTI diagnosis groups as a utilization area that could be reduced. But I also think that there are uh, all of us who, who work in emergency departments, who meet people every day, who come to the ED for various conditions, uh, ED directors, and then ideally patient groups. But those I think are much more complicated to try to 
come up with uh, representative patient focus groups, but I think ED providers would be very interested to engage in this conversation. Um, two little anecdotes, I, I've had to uh, get uh, x-rays for my children twice over the last six weeks at hours, and I look to see where can I go other the emergency department, and I live in central Vermont, and at 5.15 p.m., the option was go to, to Chittenden County. And at 7 a.m. trying to get in that ankle x-ray because she won't walk on it before school and a day of meetings, uh, it's Chittenden County. And at 6.30 p.m. last night, I saw a nice kid who broke his finger and mom knew he broke his finger and needed an x-ray and a splint. And so the only option is to come to the ER. So um, there's a lot of reasons, um, but the Monday through Friday, nine to five makes up about a quarter of the hours of the week. And the emergency department is open all of the hours of the week. So I, I think starting to think about, I think access is a really big component of it, but I think having some focus groups with ED providers, I think you could get a lot, uh, a lot of understanding of the problem and then sort of try to work through um, reducing the, the cost of that. Um, so this, Carrie, on slide 39, I think that was you who brought up this uh, pretty interesting uh, detailed chart of, I think, an organization's level data and where they sit. Um, and, and, and I guess the question that I had for you on this is, do you have any idea of, of how much this data is being accessed? Individual level, organizational level? Uh, and do you think it's it's worth people spending a lot of time accessing? Yes, to the latter question. I definitely think it's worth it. I think we're seeing access go up over time. I don't know the percent, um, and Tom may, somebody else may know more than I do, but this has only been available for a short while, this particular type of grid so that people can see it. Um, and from what I've been told by the value-based care team, the access is going up. I think people like to see how they stand in comparison to others. They cannot go into our portal and see how they stand um, directly related to other HSA practices. Like I, I can't see how my brand and practice compares to one of the primary care practices down to the little, you know, small numbers, um, the specific numbers um, in this portal. But I can compare myself across my own HSA at this point in time. We may be expanding that for the future. And, and I guess I, I, I agree with you. It looks like very useful information. Uh, and I, I can see Tom Walsh on the corner of my screen uh, and and remembering the A1C uh, data point on there, which I know is something that he's expressed a, a lot of interest as an example of something like this. Uh, is there a role? Do you think to try to incentivize providers to look at these and and then I guess subsequently try to move where they stand in a positive way? Absolutely. I don't know about incentivizing them monetarily, although that's not a bad idea. I think that is kind of folded into our population health model. And when our team goes to meet the boots on the ground workers regarding these metrics, they bring up the app, they bring up the patient list, they bring up things like this grid and they show it to their peers. So they let peers see it, they discuss it. Jody just went to Rutland and did this. Um, and everybody, she had 25 people at a meeting looking at this kind of information and talking about it together. That was last week. So that's what we want to incentivize. And on the finance side, um, the program has uh, a base payment component and then a bonus payment linked to those specific outcomes. And for us, Q1 was a reporting only quarter. We paid everybody the optimum amount, but starting in Q2, we adjusted payment levels to practices to, based on that performance, their specific performance in those domains. And what I hope happens, and I think it's starting to happen now, is that calls the providers to, you know, connect with us and say, I'd like to understand more about why I didn't meet these measures, and then we can meet them in that space and hopefully provide useful information or connections or insights so that they can raise the bar and get up and ultimately earn their maximum potential. So I guess 
Tom, that brings back the question of hospital based providers or like large organization providers versus independent providers and the layers of separation. Do you, do you think that that still reaches or impacts the the larger provider groups in a similar way as it would in the smaller provider groups? I think the smaller or independent providers are just naturally by their dual role as a business leader and a, and a healthcare provider are going to know it the, the most and the deepest and the best of, of anybody. I agree with your point before that the organizational alignment between one care and a hospital's goals is, is really critical and how they operate down below that I think is it's where it is a little bit tougher for one care. I think, you know, as I mentioned before, breaking down the reporting into site level information would help hospital leaders do their work. And if one care and the hospitals are aligned in these priority areas and they have good information to go, you know, do their good work to intervene if necessary, it'll be helpful. Um, but it, it has been a, a challenging area to really get the one care concepts to flow through these hospital organizations all the way down to the provider level. Yes. I, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I was going to say, I think that uh, it's almost as if, you know, for a larger organization, you're a, you're like a consulting um, data provider for them. And I guess the question is, do they want that consultation and how do you encourage them to want that consultation? Because it's probably the right information to get. I, I, I don't know. That's a, a, yeah, a nuanced conversation, I guess. I can yeah. certainly say, you know, at the board level, when there are conversations about investments in data, it's very clear that those other, you know, medium to larger size organizations recognize that the aligned approach is more efficient and that they might not have the resources, either direct money or staffing, to invest in building that separately. I think the challenge that we've seen just adding layers of complexity is with workforce turnover challenges in particular of the last couple of years, some of the long-standing relationships we might have had in some of those areas with finance or with quality, for example, there has been change and we're reestablishing those relationships and then trying to support how they receive tools from one care that then they don't have to re-manipulate or analyze further, but they can take and pivot to their provider-based groups that they already have set up. So that maybe one cares at that table, maybe we're at the table with the administrators and they with their, their providers. But either way, we're there to serve and support them with that information that is ultimately most important to make it actionable and digestible. Otherwise, you know, nobody's got time to move on it. And in the 2024 metrics that are on the table, there is an attestation metric for aligning with the goals of the ACO. So you want to be a member, you will attest and align with these goals. So we're hoping that will drive uh, more interest in knowing what the metrics are and working with us on those, even if the practice is hospital owned. Um, I have an awkward pivot to a topic that I think is kind of a challenging topic to discuss, which is the executive compensation bonuses, which is sort of talking with you all about your uh, bonus salary structures. Um, and I am aware of sort of the <laughs> sort of awkward nature of this conversation with you here. Um, my interest in this topic really aligns around a lot of the similar things that we've been talking about, which is sort of the power of incentives in uh, uh, moving the goalposts and trying to improve our, our healthcare system. Um, uh, you know, looking back through uh, One Care Vermont budget submissions that I have seen is that the uh, executive compensation bonuses have been paid out at 100% or near 100% uh, through most of the years, um, which, you know, reviewing the, the rule from the Green Mountain Care Board, and I think the idea of bonus compensation is that, you know, that, that, um, at least the incentive compensation that I've had through the years, that it that's sort of a really actually high. The care board rule does not address this. Care board rule addresses specific and measurable goals towards uh, either uh, reducing cost or improving quality. My personal experience is that 100% is almost never achievable in 
bonus compensation, but it all depends on how you define the, the compensation. And I don't think actually that's really the conversation today. But looking through the bonus compensation goals and measures, they they to me don't seem particularly specific. And the measurements are um vague definitely compared to the specific and measurements uh that we i think look to have our provider organizations within one care achieve um uh, and also sort of and also not very specific compared to a lot of the data that i think we now have available through uh this reporting tools from either your comparisons to other organizations or internally and i guess in those i would refer to like slide 35, where uh, Carrie presented the slides where we have a baseline performance, a comparison performance, and target. Um, to me, these are specific and measurable. Uh, you know, uh, slides, I wrote down some more here uh, in you know, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, that Sarah presented from that survey, which show. Um, you know, uh, in slide 20, sorry, slide starting slide 25, actually 24 as well, but slide 25 where the One Care Network has a far lower um, Medicare cost per patient per month compared to pure ACO groups. Um, I think these things are complicated because, again, we talk a lot about is what is the impact of One Care here? What is Vermont? What is our, you know, and then, but but at the same time, I think, you know, um, these are opportunities to measure things uh, and and attach, um, you know, loft goal compensation that's reasonable, uh, reducing emergency department visits. That seems to me to be a specific and measurable goal that could improve quality and reduce cost that could be tied to executive compensation. It doesn't have to, you know, and 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 there's lots of ways to do it. You could compare to your percentage compared to peer groups. You could look at your overall percentage. You could look at cost. There's a lot of things that are out of your control in that, but there's a lot of things that I think ideally in the conception of what one care could be, could be um, influenced by one care. So I, I don't have any um, specific, <laughs> uh, I think, out uh, um, recommendations, but I I do reading through these goals that are that the executive compensation is based upon feel that they really could be stronger towards the measurement of the goals of one care, and I, I even just considering you know the concept of unlocking funds and care coordination, we we, we put the similar, you know we're use you're using it within the activities of one care, I think it would be reasonable to use it within the executive compensation of one care. Dr. Merman, could I reflect a little bit? Absolutely. On what you shared? Yes. So this is Sarah Berry for the record. I think um, there are many threads that we could pull on and explore a little bit in uh, what you just reflected on. One historical point of clarification I'd like to start with is uh, you were mentioning looking back into prior budget cycles. And um, just to be clear, in the documentation we submitted every year, there is a decision about what a decision outside of one care's control, I should say, about what the components are that will be considered for, for variable pay. So in the past, for example, depending on the level of leadership, um, an individual's performance goal is a, a portion of that formula. A corporate goal might be a portion of it. A um, It just so happens that in 2023, it's 100% related to corporate goals, which I do, do think simplifies things a little bit, particularly for a public understanding of where those focus areas are. In terms of uh, the opportunity to make them more specific um, and more outcomes focused. I think this is something that our board too recognized and reflected on in the late fall when they were setting corporate goals and thinking about the trajectory of where they should evolve. And for us, some of this is kind of the perfect storm of timing. I'll just remind you, like the benchmarking reports weren't available. Some of the new surveys that Dr. Wolfman spoke of, we hadn't you know, designed or implemented 
implemented yet. So I actually feel like we have put some really strong and effective tools in place that can help us measure that performance. And I think it is reasonable that as we move into the next cycle, that our board will continue to explore kind of increasing the accountability that one care as an entity is responsible for and its executives through that variable pay in line with how we're increasing accountabilities for our provider network. And I can I can appreciate that. I think that, you know, like uh, we as we talked about in, in December, the challenge of having um, and the complexities of having uh, performance evaluation for an organization, a unique organization like OneCare. So thank you for that comment. Um, that was my last comment, so I I would like to pass the baton. Thank you. Thank you, though. Um, member Lunch. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to see everyone. Um, so I had a couple of specific questions. Uh, my first question around the evaluations that are in line for uh, this fall. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on why you chose to evaluate the VBIF fund, given the recent change where that's getting rolled in and what we might hope to learn that will be usable for future design. Thank you for that question. This is Sarah Berry. Um, for us, it was a fairly obvious selection because, as Dr. Wolfman described in the evolution of the PHM model, we're really integrating our care coordination and our quality programs. And some of the metrics in the VBIF for 2022 were held consistent as we move into the new year. And so we thought that it would be helpful to have a robust kind of outsider objective look at how that foundational year may or may not have had an impact. And that throughout this process, and one of the things I maybe failed to mention earlier is the reason that we have this contractor also helping us design the evaluation of our PHM model is that as they develop insights from each of these separate studies, we've said, tell us as you learn them. So if there are changes we can make now, if there's something new we need to collect or adjust, let's pivot and put that in place so that we have that information moving forward. So all of it very much kind of in the spirit of continual learning and improvement. And we are very well primed as a, a team at OneCare that some of the results might be great and some of them might be terrible, right? Like that, that is to be expected when we are doing new things in this space, but the goal is to inform how we get better and how we invest um, or make changes in those investments. Thank you, that was helpful. Um, when you were talking about the uh, value-based care team meetings in the local HSAs, you talked about how you've expanded the participant list to uh, many, different, uh, many different folks from the community partners. I was wondering if you've looked at how that invite list sort of compares to the blueprint community health teams in those areas and uh, what kind of overlap there may or may not be. I can take that one, Robin. Um, we invited Blueprint leaders to come to the meetings. So that's how we dealt with that. We did our best to identify. We asked a lot of questions, um, sent out emails to all the HSAs saying who should come. And we said multiple times during each conversation, if you know someone who isn't here that should be here, please invite them. And we got feedback that more people need to be invited. But Blueprint is definitely invited and did participate. Great. I, I would just have assumed that some of the leaders from, for example, the DAs and the home health agencies may also have a seat on the community health team, potentially, or mm -hmm. a person on those teams. So uh, mm -hmm. I was just curious about that. Um, on the mental health screening proposal, um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how you see this fitting in or not fitting in with uh, the Blueprint's legislative proposal to add dollars um, to support mental health integration and screening um, in practices. I think it aligns nicely. I don't know at this point how some of the efforts might overlap. I think that remains to be seen. 
I think all of us in healthcare um, work hard not to duplicate efforts. And I do see across the state more and more partnering between um, all the community health team members, Blueprint included. So I think this will be collaborative and hopefully it will create exponential improvements in our screening as well as our referrals to treatment. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think actually between Dave and Jess, they've hit on uh, my other questions. So I'll be short and sweet. Thank you. Great, um, Member Walsh. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming in and presenting. Um, there were a lot of good things. I I, I think I want to be sure to to uh, um, acknowledge those and um, talk a little bit about them. The simplification and focus that uh, Miss Barry spoke of, I think, is um, is an important thing. The evaluations plan for the CPR program, the care coordination, VBI. Um, and the mental health initiative, all really good things. Those are the types of things that we see in high performing ACOs from around the country. Um, I think um, Dr. Wolfman, the uh, slide 39 that Dave mentioned, where providers can drill down into their HSA, their facility and their own performance. Um, I thought that that was an excellent example of, of how quality improvement actually gets done. Right, and how you address outlier um, findings in healthcare. Um, I wonder, I wondered there specifically whether the comparison was within the facility. Are you just comparing providers to other providers in that facility, or are they compared to the peer network or ACOs overall? Where's the comparison in those um, in office? that in-office feedback? I think what you're asking is, would I as a provider um, in Brandon be able to compare myself to a, a similar provider at another HSA in a practice? And that is not something that we can do yet on the portal. Um, so it is within the HSA. However, what I can see there, as you noticed at the bottom of that slide, is where I rank across the HCAs um, so I can see if I'm number 10 out of 14 with diabetes control, that should be a signal to me that I should focus, I should get that patient list, I should run the list, I should have my team work on it. So I think we will advance to where there's more and more and more transparency. This is a big first step. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's great, right? Because as a as a provider in in an organization. Um, I'd like to know where I rank among my peers in my hallway, um, yeah. but also how my organization ranks, and then how the ACO, the group, the overarching enterprise ranks. And, and that comes up in the benchmarking report too, that the, um, there's tension, as um, Sarah pointed out, with comparisons. Um, and the best, you know, the example, I'll make fun of myself, I used to like to do running and cycling races, um, and I could occasionally win my age group, and get a certificate for a free cupcake someplace, right, and feel really good that I won my age group. But I finished 10 minutes behind the winner of the women's 60 to 69 group. Right, so it, the comparisons matter. And it's, you, as in a high performing system, you want to seek out the highest performance. There is, of course, a tension that if you're constantly comparing yourself to the best and you come up short, you get discouraged, burnt out and give up. Right. And so part of the work of an organization that is supporting quality improvement is to maintain that tension. So there's always a drive for improvement without the burnout and giving up. And it, it's it's hard work, but getting, having the courage to really assess what is top performing is, is an important part. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the work you all did um, during the holidays and in the winter to, st to stabilize the CPR payments. Um, that was 
a, a difficult time, I'm sure, and you did it. And and that's a good thing. Um, along with the benchmarking reports and, and how you how you perform, you, you talked about some initiatives, the peer-to-peer -peer learning, some different things. I'm wondering um, what you consider your number one priority for the next couple of years. Wow, I, I have six number ones. <laughs> That's yeah. hard. But you hard. know, I guess it, you know, if I were try to find the right level of which to answer that question, for me, it's that we are driving performance and outcomes through our PHM program. And that we recognize that the specific targets for measures and measures themselves, you know, can and will vary over time as we shift the spotlight based on improvement happening in our network, but ultimately kind of back to the earlier point about simplification and focus, that's really our belief in how we're going to effectuate change. And so we're steering the ship around that. Right, and and that's, you know, you mentioned there are six number ones and and I understand that feeling. And the at the same time, the simplification and focus, right? Like it's, um, we're in a period for this particular ACO where there's declining enrollment and the the future is a bit uncertain and so trying to figure out what is the key role is it a pass through organization that takes money from the federal government and distributes it across the network that could be a primary role and there's probably a budget that's the right size for that there could be a primary role of conducting benchmark analyses and helping organizations improve and a budget that re reflects that. They, they could be very different budgets. And so trying to, I think what we're tasked with at the moment as the care board, um, whether we liked it or not, or whether we thought we'd be doing it when we signed up for the care board, we're, we, we have a lens of this fiscal responsibility that we have to keep in mind. Um, so I, I want to ask a little bit more about the enrollment. Um, in an early slide, I think it was slide four, but I'm not exactly sure, the estimates for Medicaid attribution were rising significantly. But we know that across the country, Medicaid is unwinding. And so I would expect Medicaid numbers not to rise, but to decline. And so I'd like to understand how you arrived at your numbers. Sure thing, I can take that one. Uh, these are the attribution numbers that were delivered to OneCare from Diva. So I think Diva is a good source of information about kind of the general trends and patterns of uh, their covered lives. And uh, it's a formulaic approach essentially that delivers the attribution to OneCare Vermont. Around the decline, what we do expect to experience throughout the performance year is that as the Medicaid redetermination process begins, we expect to see higher than typical attribution attrition throughout the year as certain Medicaid covered lives are uh, essentially exempted from the program and pick up a different insurance. Hopefully um, we should see our attribution count decay throughout the year. It always does, but I think the rate of decay will be more aggressive once redetermination begins. Yeah, so I, I think that's the the correct read on the national situation, right? Those, um, and in some estimates, that reattribution could um, lead to a substantial loss, a substantial number of people who lose their coverage in the order of 20 to 30 percent. And I don't know what percentage of patients or people with Medicaid in Vermont are currently attributed. And if that if those that are attributed, if the decay would be the same, we're making a lot of assumptions, but a 30% loss would be very substantial. Right. Um, we, I hope that it's not that much. I hope people, not that many people lose their coverage. And I'd like people who are have that coverage to be attributed but it looks like it could be substantial. 
And so I'll, we'll put a pin in it for our staff to try to connect with DEBA. But I think it's important that we try to understand that um, together with you. So the, de the declining enrollment with the Blue Cross Blue Shield withdrawal, the unwind Medicaid unwinding, um, trying to determine a budget that best reflects the primary role of the ACO, I think is um, what our meeting today then is about. And so I'm I'm trying to reflect on that and to think about what budget items are fixed and what are variable. And Tom spoke about that earlier that of course there's a high proportion of fixed cost. Right. Um, and there's, there's an old economics joke, right? Everything is variable if your time horizon is long enough. Right. But so, so what we're dealing with is trying to figure out what's fixed and variable in our time horizon over the next couple of years and what makes a fiscally responsible budget given the declining enrollment and the primary function or functions. Um, and I, I'm so I'm struggling with the reduction in the budget that reflects the 2% that the board ordered in the winter, but doesn't seem to shift much with the 30% decline in enrollment, roughly 30% with Blue Cross Blue Shield. So I don't feel that that's been a Address directly so far. So, if someone would like to address that for me to help me think about it, I'd appreciate it. Sure, I'd be happy to start, and I'm sure my colleagues will weigh in. But I think the fixed Thank cost you, point is very important because there are functions any ACO needs to have in order to operate. And whether you look at it as one fewer payer contract or X number of attributed lives, the reality is there's a, a, a bucket of work. And yeah. so I still need people who can collect the monthly required data to submit to all of our payers on which providers are assigned to which organizations and make sure that's flowing. I still need people to negotiate every payer and vendor contract and participant contract that's out there. We still must operate a help desk and a customer service line, a grievance process, a compliance process. So. When I think about this, what I actually go back and reflect upon is where we were in our investments um, in terms of you know, technology, contracts, et cetera, and our staffing just prior to the pandemic. And from a very high level, what sticks in my mind is that we had a budget approved by this board for 80 FTEs. And that was a growth phase. So we were growing, I'd have to go back and check the exact number, but say maybe by 10 FTEs at that time. We now have 47 FTEs. We're about as small as we can get to still make all of our operations work. And our team are incredibly talented and overworked every single day, to be frank. There is not a person on our team who isn't, you know, as is your staff, putting in many, many, many extra hours all of the time. So that's the component that says to me, it is always our responsibility to look for efficiencies, to reduce duplications, and we will continue to do that. Uh, it's our obligation to Vermonters. And I don't think there's a lot there at this point in time that will allow us to continue to deliver what we need to, to the state of Vermont, to our provider network, and as we've been talking about in the theme today, to, to keep focused and improve. But those, that's my perspective, but I'd invite Carrie or Tom to add anything I might have missed. I think you said it well, Sarah. I think you said it well. Okay. Um, well, thank you for sharing your thoughts. And it's, it's not a fun question. And um, I just, I'll pass it back to the chair, but just before that, I want, um, I do want to close with an acknowledgement of the analytic work and the work that you're doing with clinics, that's exactly the type of thing that we look for in high performing ACOs across the country. So I think I'd like to commend you for that work. 
And back to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, why don't we just take a quick five minute break to give a little breather, and then I'll do, I have a few questions. We'll do healthcare advocate and public comments. We'll come back at 1120. Um, thank you all for the presentation. I don't have a whole lot, um, but before I ask my questions, I'll just preface it by saying that one of my focuses as a here at the care board is on affordability and um, we're really looking for a lot of organizations to look hard at themselves to where they can find savings because there's only so many places we can get them for for, for vermonters and second um, performance improvement right there's only two ways we can really improve our healthcare system for people and that's performance and frankly affordability um, so we are asking i am asking everybody to really try hard in that effort. Um, and your presentation today was great. I think it was, a, it was really well laid out and helpful. Um, I took away that you have a focus on primary care and, and mental health, which I really appreciated and think are two very critical areas to focus on. And at slides 29 and 42, um, I appreciated you describing what OneCare is planning to do to address some of those issues. And some were the performance targets, sharing those targets, learning from each other, and those things. My question is whether you think those are sufficient to move the needle on those key uh, areas. I, this is Sarah. I'd be happy to start. I, I think that, yes, we will start to see the needle move. But I think to your broader point, uh, Chair Foster, about affordability, this is a big, complicated topic to tackle. And so it's going to take collective efforts from lots of organizations. The ACO is one. And it's going to take time. And so I think from our lens as an ACO, what we're really focused on is you know, making sure that we are spotlighting our incentives and our supports for our organizations in a consistent manner, that it's action oriented, and that we are continuing that path to kind of set higher and higher uh, accountabilities over time so that we could expect, you know, a, kind of a tipping point somewhere down the road where we really are maximizing the quality outcomes that we're looking for as well as the cost management. I don't think we're there yet, and I don't think we'll be there in a year or even two, but I think long-term commitment to healthcare reform will allow us to get there as a state, the ACO being part of that. I, I agree. It will be collective efforts and time for sure. Um, my question is really focused today just on are the incentives that OneCare has the best that they think they can do um, for these issues? And what I'm getting at a little bit is um, are the financial levers and incentives sufficient? Is the sharing in, of the information sufficient? Or is there anything else, in your opinion, one care can do to, to ramp up the performance on some of these? I would like to add something um, that Tom touched on, which is there's a fine balance between what we're demanding and breaking point for people who already feel overworked. And so what I think will help bridge that is meeting with people where they are, going to their location, building relationships, um, seeing what they're doing, boots on the ground, and getting buy-in. And when we had a conversation last week with another high-performing ACO, that's exactly what they said. That's how they're reducing ED utilization. They need to go where the work is being done and support people, both with the data and analytics, but also in a way that says we're in this together and we want to be inspirational and not just demanding. In the, to that, go ahead, Tom. Go ahead, Mr. Boyce. In the finance space, I was just going to mention that uh, I don't think we're where we need to be ultimately yet, but I do think that we're on the right track. And specifically, we have a mix of what is essentially a base payment to providers then an amount that's connected to outcomes and bonuses through time, I think we need to adjust that line and do so in a way that doesn't pull the financial rug out from under the providers, because I do know they rely on these payments, but enhance the focus on the outcomes and the accountabilities that we expect and align the financial incentives accordingly. And I think and hope that that will help us raise the bar on many of those measures. Thank you for that. That's sort of what I was getting at. Is Are the financial inducements beneficial enough? Because a lot of these providers are struggling with burden and is the money good enough to drive the change and make it worthwhile for them? 
It's a great question, um, a really great question. It's also a tension point in the one care budget, I and mean, we have limited resources and means. We often hear from our uh, network of providers that the work it takes of them to deliver on these outcomes or fill these programs is that it actually costs them more in some ways to do that. But we try as best we can to provide those financial resources to evolve the system to one that thinks about outcomes and results more than they did when it was a disaggregated fee for service system. Right. So right. So if I when I looked at that slide, I think it was 28 um, primary care, which is a a big focus for myself personally. I know on many other board members and yourselves, I've heard it a number of times. Um, slide 28, we're compared to the 50th percentile. I'll start by saying I don't think 50th percentile is our goal here in the state. We want to be better than that by quite a bit. And yet we are lagging significantly um, on uh, primary care visits and annual wellness visits from even the 50th percentile. So when I read that, we're we're not where we need to be. Um, and the performance um, in our ACO um, network is actually sliding and going backwards a little bit. So we were 12.8% or 14% behind, and now we're 16. Um, 15. So it's going the wrong direction. And we're really low to start. So I guess my challenge or question is that we need to make sure we're looking at this budget to <laughs> fix this. Um, and I get it. I, I forget who said it, but you're right. It's not just the ACO, but there is a role for the ACO. And the bigger the role is for the ACO, the better, I think. Um, so I think it's important to look at what we're doing financially for these providers so that these numbers are not going this way. Um, on that, on slide nine, I think you had some of the dollars that Mr. Boris was alluding to. I think it's 9.7 million and 1.5 million for the PHM for primary care, I think. I'll just expand to say a significant portion of these population health management payments find their way to primary care, either as the base payments or through the CPR program or as incentives. Right. As to these two numbers, 9.7 and the 1.5, um, I guess one thing I want to understand is um, when you make the payment, if it goes back to a hospital for their primary care providers, how do we assure that it's being used for primary care provider initiatives by that organization? It's a great question. Certainly a challenging dynamic for us at OneCare where our uh, authority effectively ends at the 10 level once we make that payment. Um, what One of the strategies is through communication and also communication on the payment statements to really make it clear that this payment is for the purposes of you know, primary care support or care coordination, things like that, to help direct the funds to the the correct part of the organization, but that is ultimately the responsibility of the organization to use the funds in, in the appropriate spirit. Okay. So the best source for us to ensure that this money is actually supporting primary care in its entirety is the hospitals themselves. Yes. Um, Dr. Merman asked a little bit about executive compensation, and one of the comments I heard, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dave, I see your hands up. Oh, sorry, this is actually a, just a question on the last question, which is, so is there a mechanism to track payments that go, once they go to a tax ID number, that you can then track where they go from there, or is that basically not trackable once they go to the hospital? Uh, it's not trackable for us unless we were to ask for specific reporting. And, and I guess at this point you have not asked for that specific reporting. We haven't. It's been, you know, I try to make sure that the payments are clear and, and suggest where the funds go, but I also recognize each of the hospitals are structured a little bit differently. Some have centralized infrastructure to manage a lot of this work, and that might actually be the appropriate space for some of the funds to go, while another hospital has a different infrastructure. So I, all of our programs are designed to accommodate just the, the differences of our provider network, and that's why we've been a little bit less prescriptive in this space. Thanks. 
And do you have a breakdown of how much money this in these two buckets we're talking about goes to independent practices versus hospital based versus FQHC? We do have that information and I believe if I remember correctly, it was included in the supplemental information I sent over last night. Let me pull it up quickly. All right. Um, of the of the population health management payments, which will include the one care payments plus the diva payments that don't flow through one care but will go in spirit of one care programs, plus what's included from a uh, Blue Cross again estimates, um, about ten and a half million go to hospital employed primary care, uh, about six. 0.5 million goes to independent primary care and about 6.6 .6 goes to federally qualified health centers. And that is a, a direct product of the attribution mix. The payments for this particular initiative are all done on a per member per month basis. The per member per month amounts are identical across all different primary care types. We do not discriminate between any of them. So the way that those funds are apportioned is, is simply a product of the attribution landscape across the OneCare network. Theoretically, could you adjust that so that the payments are actually uh, more favorable for independents or FQHC versus hospital base? Um, theoretically, we could. That would be at the discretion of the One Care Board and would have to be contemplated relative to kind of the, the overall economics. And um, but yes, in, in concept, yes. Um, on the executive compensation, I thought someone said it that the incentive comp, the bonus comp has been achieved pretty consistently. Aside from the COVID years, um, can you give us a sense of um, how much of the bonus comp has been paid out? Let me start. That's a bad question. I apologize. Why don't we just do last year? Um, was 100% of the incentive comp paid out for last year for the executive level? Uh, I don't believe so, but we could check and and tell you the proportion. I heard Dr. Merman say that he has not always received 100% of his bonus opportunity, and I assure you, Dave, that this year you will. All of the board members will. Um, that would be helpful, um, you know, in looking at whether or not the executive comp and incentive comp is aligned with uh, achieving the goals. I think getting a sense of um, the percentage of achievement of the incentive comp would be helpful to see. So I'd like to put in a request that we see that for all years, what was possible versus what was paid out for the um, C-suite level. Um, and, you know, I do think that Financial incentives make a difference, um, and I would recommend, I think what Dr. Merman said, which is considering if you're looking at the things that we're trying to improve, ED utilization, mental health, primary care, I think it would be, and we have objective data here now available, it would be logical to me to tie executive comp at the organization to improving those numbers, right? So if we're seeing the PCP levels go down, I, it would be great to see those um, uh, objectives aligned. I think that would be helpful. So I'd put in a plug um, that that'd be a good thing to do. Um, on the mental health screening, the $1.6 million, um, I was wondering what happens if um, people don't do it at such a level that you have to pay out 1.6? Let's say there's only $500,000 of people that hit that metric. What happens to the other money? Great question there. As OneCare has evolved and had a greater portion of its expense base in the population health management category linked to outcomes, it, it brings into play the reality that not every dollar will be paid out uh, to, to the participants. And um, we do not want to pro profit on our provider network. That's never been our goal is to earn a profit on the backs of the hospitals. So I think there will be discussion and decisions around whether or not those funds will be deferred and essentially used in the next year as incentives or even refunded to the hospitals. That's a, a decision that our finance committee and the board will have to grapple with. But I can say with confidence that there's no intent to for one care to profit on uh, 
funds that essentially weren't paid out through bonuses. Yeah, no, I get that. I, I'm just trying to understand where it does go. Um, so it would be the board votes on whether or not to pay it back to the hospitals. Or if there's a methodology to defer those funds to be used in a future year so that we can you know, maybe limit or minimize some financial back and forth between one care and its hospitals. And with the um, PHM bonus money, has there ever been years in which the uh, full incentive amount was not realized? Uh, 22 will have some of that dynamic in play. We're rounding out our 2022 final care coordination uh, reporting, so I don't have an exact number for you, but I do expect that there will be some funds uh, left on the table, so to speak. Um, so it's it's a newer paradigm that is starting to bubble up as we've, as I said before, advanced the amount of money in you must earn it buckets. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I'll put in a request for that too for for bonus money. Um, uh, I'd like to have some numbers on how much has been achieved in the past couple of years and how much, um, which was not what happened to it and where it went. Because in evaluating the entirety of this program. When we look at the budgets, it's just on what is possible. Um, but if a lot of this money is not being paid out, and it's just going back to the hospitals. There may be need to have some tweaks, um, sure, because the incentive incentive incentives won't be as sufficient um, as hoped. And also, um, how attainable are the goals to you know balancing all that? Sure. Um, saw that there was a fairly drastic reduction in the number of FTEs. I think it was, I don't know where I put it now, but it was down to 47 from maybe 63 or something like that. Um, and was that from the original budget submitted to the board to today, that, that reduction of all those positions? So there's really a, a kind of a two-step dance here. The first um, was a reduction that was between 2022's budget and the original 2023 budget that we submitted last fall, with the ma biggest material change being the transition of analytics staff. That was roughly 10 FTEs, nine or 10 FTEs. Then this go around, uh, there were five FTEs uh, taken out of the budget to accommodate the 2% admin cut. I could slide 18 where you describe those positions. Right. How was it determined that those would be the positions that would be cut to um, implement the 2% admin cut? They were all vacant and we did not want to do any layoffs because we have plenty of work to do. We need every person that we have. So there was an evaluation. Oh, okay. Was the evaluation? Have you ever had an evaluation manager? No, that was going to be a new position. Which has been cut due to the admin cut that the board implemented or required. Yes. And in turn, we, uh, in the revised budget, took those salary dollars and needed to increase them fairly substantially to afford the evaluation contractor you know, with the level of expertise that could do everything we described to you. Right. Um, you described for member homes, um, some of the advertising um, budget, I think is $50,000 now. Is there any money spent on, on lobbying or is that part of the advertising or is that somewhere else? It is some somewhere else. We do have a contract with a, a firm that helps us with legislative affairs. Where would I find that expense? If you give me a moment, I can find it for you. I don't want to delay the discussion here. I believe it's in a contracted expense line. Okay. 
I've seen that. And I just received confirmation from my amazing team that that is correct. And um, in terms of the org chart, the staff did a presentation for the board on Wednesday um, with the FTEs, and it looked like there was 5.75 FTEs for public affairs. Can you describe what that is and what the work is from the public affairs group? I'd be happy to take it. So um, I think that, you know, one of the learnings that I will take away from this process is that we could do a better job of describing some categories to you all of where functional work lands that some of our categories um, maybe just aren't as intuitive. So in public affairs as a bucket, it includes communications. So helping our team to design and review communications like the reports we've been talking about today to our provider network, um, getting the word out around the mental health initiative and helping us to um, kind of identify the right audiences within our network to drive some of that change. It includes um, positions that are specifically supporting our board and governance committees through all of the, the work of you know, planning and material execution and, and minutes and everything else that goes into that. Um, it is also managing our website, uh, thinking about our presence on those online forums, such as LinkedIn or Twitter, um, and a whole host of other internal communications and uh, liaising with key stakeholders in our network. So making sure that we have regular engagements with uh, representative bodies, whether that be from the designated agencies or our home health agencies or others to make sure that we are hearing uh, kind of what the needs and opportunities are from our network. Um. The cut that occurred, you may have said this, and I apologize, um, but the $300,000 or so that was from the board instituted cut, um, where where did that money go? What was it used for? Or what is it being used for in this budget? It was essentially restored as population health management payments. Um, it's a little bit of a through the chain, but when we decided to ultimately leave the hospital participation fees flat, any extra funds that we had available either through uh, the 2% admin cut or other changes that occurred in the budget got reinvested into the network. I would echo what I think Dr. Merman said as well, which was that the CPR program is generally, we receive extremely positive feedback um, on that. Um, is there any plan to ramp up the uh, financial investment in that? Yeah, I think we are interested in both expanding the the investment and the breadth of the program, covering more providers and provider types. Uh, this was designed to be a program specifically for independent primary care uh, when when one care is really ramping up under the all payer model era. Uh, and as since since then, we've grown to have a pretty good percentage of the independent primary care providers in our network participating. But it starts to beg the question: Could something similar be overlaid for FQHCs or even hospital employed? practices. There are some technical challenges to that, um, but it's something that we're actively thinking about and working on. In terms of the level of investment, we established in 2023 a linkage to the total cost of care, which is a concept that has gained some traction both in Vermont and nationally. Uh, it's tricky to do it that way, but it, it provides the framework for us to have you know, deliberate and transparent investment in primary care and trying to direct more of the healthcare funding pie into primary care practices. Um, on the um, benchmarking, uh, there was a data point about um, the low spend uh, on PMPM. Um, it's slide 25. And I apologize if another member asked this and I'm repeating it, but the ACO peer cohort, peer cohort is at the 50th percentile and all ACO national cohort is at 90th percentile. Is that a typo or is there a reason for doing it that way? 
Um, it was uh, available data. So the way that the report comes out, uh, we only have the 50th percentile for the peer cohort, and that's a product of the size of that cohort. Whereas the request from the staff to the Green Mountain Care Board in this latest revision was to include the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles. So uh, again, uh, just looking at what was available to us for data. Okay, but you have the 50th percentile for the all ACO national cohort for the other measures, just not for the PMPM costs? No, it's available in the report for the PMPM costs. I could look it up for you. Sorry, I might have misunderstood. So you use the 50th percentile for these other measures that are in the presentation, but the 90th for the PMPM. And, Correct. And I thought you said that was because that was what was available. No, I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. So the peer cohort bar, which is consistently the 50th percentile, you know, is the same throughout. The national cohort that represents 513 ACOs, we did vary which percentile benchmark for different slides. And if you uh, want to go back to uh, the prior slide that has the areas of strength and opportunity, we've put in footnotes there where the comparison is to the 50th or the 90th. So trying to be as clear as we are, we are not trying to ever claim we are or better or worse than we are, um, but in terms of trying to think about where there is opportunity for improvement and who we might reach out to and how we might connect, we're trying to be a bit more focused. And I, I don't think, uh, I guess I'll ask, you don't have information available um, for the PMPM costs for uh, Medicaid or commercial Right. We we don't. We have uh, explored that together with your staff, um, and there is some very nascent work happening, um, but no one that has, to our knowledge, pooled the data in a cost-effective manner and has been able to kind of get through the processes, particularly in the Medicaid population, around the differences in plans from state to state. Um, you know, I think we're hopeful that we could get there over time, but it's really gonna be watching what happens nationally as well in terms of aggregators of that data. But you have your settlement amounts over the years for Correct. just, yeah, okay. Correct. And on based on those, has one care um, been below total cost of care for Medicaid and commercial such as it has for Medicare or would there be um, difference in results? Uh, starting with Medicaid, I can speak to this. Uh, we have a, a very strong track record. And I recommend looking at the Medicaid results year over year in a way that combines fixed payment performance. In other words, performance out of that fixed payment and the shared savings result at the end of the year. Um, and and I think all but one years, uh, uh, one year, uh, one care has beat that total cost of care target. So it's been a strong track record in that program. The commercial uh, landscape has been a little bit different. Uh, I think it's been harder for us to um, perform and some of it might be dynamics due to the way the target is set or methodology, but we do not have a strong track record in the commercial space. And I would just add, don't um, forget that in the quality space, there are national benchmarks for Medicaid and for commercial insurers and that we present that data uh, every fall to you all. On the commercial, so obviously, you know, our commercial expense in Vermont is exceedingly high. We're a very low Medicare um, cost state, exceedingly high uh, commercial. So, I mean, looking at from the pressing problems facing Vermont, uh, to the extent the ACO is having an ability to perform well on Medicare, it would be really great to see it perform well on commercial, where they've really been suffering um, from large increases. And I think. Mr. Boris, you alluded to um, part of the challenge being in how the targets were set. Is that to suggest that the targets are uh, more ambitious for commercial? I think in the commercial commercial market, it's challenging because of the magnitude of change that occurs from year to year. In the public payer programs, pretty stable increases from one fiscal year performance year to the next. That makes it a little bit more reliable to set a, a fair benchmark for the providers to go and beat in the commercial marketplace, especially lately where there's been some very significant inflationary or cost increases. It makes setting that target more challenging. And I think we've 
we we face those challenges through the years of how to make sure we have a good fair target that gives a good fair result at the end of the year. Um, I don't want to hold up wounds here, but was that part of Blue Cross's decision to pull out was that they weren't seeing the savings? I know there's the data issue. I think they put it in the press release. Uh, I don't believe they specifically referenced the target methodology, but I will say that OneCare worked throughout 2022 uh, collaboratively with the actuarial team from Blue Cross to come up with a, a revised target methodology that we felt like would be uh, an improvement for 2023's business. And it changed the way that the cost evaluation was going to occur, it was planned to change that. Um, I, I don't know, this would be a question for them, but I, it was never communicated to me that that was a, uh, a concern that would have caused them to uh, not contract with us in 2023. Okay. Um, I've been taking away from your comments that in one cares view, there's not really any, um, I don't really love the phrase, but fat to trim off the budget that that you, everyone's working very hard and, and there's no real places for additional savings. Um, I sent a letter to OneCare on February 9th um, encouraging OneCare to uh, consider whether there are further reductions in the admin budget that could be better utilized to support primary care. Could the OneCare budget be smaller and could that money be reinvested in primary care? Some of the major challenges we're seeing in the benchmarking data. And so my question is whether or not those that was considered and what you looked at and what the outcome was. Certainly considered. Um, OneCare has uh, over a number of years really worked hard to thin out its infrastructure as much as possible in spirit of reducing the, the dues essentially charged the hospitals by, I appreciate your point about how to reinvest those funds in primary care as well. Going back to what Sarah said eloquently before, there are just core functions that need to be fulfilled for us to operate these programs responsibly. Uh, it's a huge responsibility, in my opinion, to manage these programs or tremendous amount of dollars linked to them and the financial stability of providers, particularly those accepting a fixed payment. So we face a tension between how deep we can cut and can we continue to responsibly can facilitate these programs into the future. Uh, through time, you know, the future may Oper uh, uh, make available to us some different changes or structural changes we can make. But right now, uh, we our cup is overflowing and we felt like it was very important to sustain the level of inf infrastructure we have now to both support what we have going on, but what might be coming down the pike in a future iteration of the all payer model. Um. You've described a number of changes that have occurred from the budget um, that the care board originally reviewed in fiscal year 23 and um, what what you're presenting today. Um, I assume that you've been operating consistent to date with what you've been presenting today. That's correct. And we're, I'm talking about the BCBS withdrawal, the UVM self-funded, the MVP lives, change in risk, population health management payments, all of those, um, would you agree with the characterization those are significant changes to the budget? We feel that we've um, communicated all of those transparently to the Green Mountain Care Board, both through the hearing process and through all the subsequent documentation that we've provided when requested or proactively. So, so I, those seem to be fairly significant changes, right? The amounts of money being paid out, the number of lives, the payers, the whole, it's a big change. Um, and I guess my question is, has One Care requested a budget amendment? We have not requested an amendment and our council did not believe it was necessary. And have you communicated to the care board why a budget amendment would not be necessary if your performance to date is not consistent with the budget order that's in place? Our council has spoken with your council. I was not there, so I can't characterize the conversation. Um, on the benchmarking, I understand that um, you know there's you described eloquently how they were done, the different uh, benchmarks that were used. Um, on the uh, vendor recommended version, um, it's obviously important for us to have comfort that the methodology used and the comparison 
uh, ACOs are appropriate, because if they're not, then the data is really largely useless. Um, it's it's like comparing myself to an Olympic skier versus somebody who's never skied. Uh, it matters who you put me up against. And, um, although the people who've never skied up and will probably ski a lot better than me too. Um, I know our staff has asked for uh, some insights into that, and I would just emphasize that that's extremely important because otherwise this data is largely meaningless. I can't have comfort that it's right until our staff has a chance to uh, appreciate what was done to get the methodology. Um, my understanding is those requests have been going on for a while, and it's a little disappointing that it's coming after uh, two hearings on this, um, but I would like to make sure that that happens uh, promptly so that we can uh, be sure that what we're looking at makes good sense. And I'm sure it does, but we definitely want that comfort. My understanding is that meeting is scheduled for next week. Great, perfect. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have any other questions at this time. I don't, so thank you all very much for your answers and for your presentation. Um, is helpful. Oh, yeah, sorry. And actually, two, uh, I think Dr. Merman and maybe Dr. Uh, Jess Holmes have a question as well. Go ahead, Dave. I just have a few follow-ups from things Chair Foster brought up. So with regards, Tom, you mentioned about the approximately was it 10 point something million dollars that goes to the hospitals. That's for fixed prospective payments for hospital-based primary care providers, correct? Uh, no, that's separate from the fixed perspective payments. These are payments linked back to the population health management program itself, okay. which is separate. Okay. Um, right, right. So it'd be far more. I'm just trying to figure out, are there, what is the total amount of money that would be paid out to, to member hospital-based uh, organizations um, that would be beyond what they would typically receive for those services. So you, you're you're bringing up a great question. That is one of the challenges we're facing in the CPR program expansion work is how to take a hospital organization and cleanly delineate what's their primary care work versus other hospital work based on the way the billing occurs. That line is more difficult. Uh, to figure out than one might think. So we, when we evaluate, at least at present, um, the performance of a hospital, it's more in aggregate. Did the hospital in total perform well relative to their fixed payment, or did they have overruns? And we've seen both occur through time. Um, but part of the goal of the CPR expansion is to figure out a way that we can reliably measure the primary care component of a hospital organization and then establish over that the CPR methodology or framework. Okay. I guess my question gets to it, the idea that if a, if hospital dues are 15, roughly $15 million, $14.8 million, and $10 million is coming in population health management payments, you know, so so does that mean they're, that's money that's going back to them, the effective buy-in they have is $5 million to, for one care? Is that a fair description? In aggregate, I think you're you're capturing it properly. I can happy to help validate the numbers, but in aggregate, yes, there there is an investment that the hospitals make in the one care infrastructure, and then they also help to supplement the PHM program on top. So some of the money that they get back actually might be coming from them in the first place. So we, it's a complicated funds flow, but a hospital, in my view, should be looking at their hospital participation fee expense but also relative to funds flow coming back to them through value-based care programs. So it's kind of a way for us to affect where the funds go, what are the accountabilities under those funds, and champion the concepts of value-based care. And, and in the all-pair model arrangement, through the way Medicare benchmarks are set, do the does that give the hospitals overall a higher payment than they would get if we were not in an all-payer model agreement? A great question. It gives them a potential for higher payment, uh, not a guarantee. So 
essentially the way the Medicare program works is that there is a target delivered that has that uh, inflationary trend that this board approves every year. I believe it was 5.2% for 2023. If a hospital is able, or the, the network at large is able to live within that 5.2% trend, financial benefit materializes through shared savings. So okay. it's it's a, not a guarantee of additional revenue, but it's an opportunity to earn additional revenue through effective population health management. And how would how would the last fiscal year look with regards to that? Uh, last fiscal year is projecting to be uh, favorable again at present based on the data that we have. We believe we'll have enough shared savings to cover the blueprint expense, which is a very important priority, and then a little bit of extra shared savings for the providers, uh, uh, which is both primary care providers and overflow to the hospitals. Um, because of the narrower risk corridor, which is a product through the uh, pandemic and as well as the financial health of the hospitals, there's not that much financial potential for hospitals right now. Um, so it's you know maybe a million that would get allocated across all, all the network providers through our risk sharing model. So, so would you say from your perspective looking at this that overall it's financially neutral or advantageous for hospitals to pay dues into one care to support one care's activities as opposed to a cost to them? We've had good results in the past, uh, net favorable results through time, which is great. It means that one care can continue to support its providers and creates, to me, what I hope is a virtuous cycle. Um, so I think that's great. I also caution any participant in, in our network to think about or not to think about shared savings as a, a reliable revenue stream. Uh, I hope we beat it every single year, but the reality is, is that it's a new paradigm. And some years there'll be shared savings, some years there's shared losses, but shared losses to me, it's not the preferred outcome, obviously, but it is the system at work. It's the providers saying, we didn't deliver care as efficiently as we promised, therefore there's a payment back to the payer. So I don't think that's a bad thing inherently when it does occur. Um, it's really why these con programs and concepts make sense to me. Um, but of course, I hope that we can deliver shared savings every year to the providers and then use those financial gains to reinvest in the future of what OneCare is trying to do. Okay, thanks. So I, I, just a few more. Chair Foster mentioned this observation that OneCare is very focused on primary care and care coordination, which makes me, um, and, you know, and the idea of keeping people out of the hospital to reduce overall total cost of care and cost. That said, you know, we can look at the numbers exactly, but I think it's somewhere about 9.7% of funds go into primary care. So the bulk, the vast majority of funds are hospital based uh, activities. Does one care have any um, programs or ability to develop programs to try to reduce hospital? associated costs? I think all of our programs in some way or another are designed to do that. And this is where, you know, I'm a champion for as, payment as, reform. As, as opposed to prevention of receiving care in the hospital, the actual care oh, delivered in the hospital, is there, are there any programs that can, that, that one care has or could potentially develop, or is it sort of out of the scope of one care to try to manage hospital costs? I would say it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I would just say this points back to some of the critical questions you all have been bringing up today about, you know, kind of what's the size of one care and the investment and where are the opportunities to improve? So we've had conversations over the years, quite a few of them about should we, could we, how would we develop programs targeting specialists or targeting specific um, inpatient uh, experiences. And to date, we've had to make the tough decision to focus our energy in the community. So in primary care with our continuum of care partners, that's not to say there aren't great ideas out there or things that could be done, but with resource constraints, we've had to make that tough decision not to go there thus far. Uh, two more things. Um, you mentioned, Sarah, since we were just chatting uh, about the peer cohort not being able to get, um, because the cohort's too small, you can't um, reliably calculate a 90th percentile uh, for comparison. Is that the, am I saying that? 
correctly. You, you can technically calculate it, and it was calculated back in the fall. The N is two ACOs when you do that. Uh, but my understanding of the way that that was calculated is that you, you pick the two highest performing ACOs and then from a cost, the two lowest cost ACOs, and then looked at them. So they're not, uh, and I think the staff was interested in seeing and I, the discussion was that in each one of those metrics, who is the 90th percentile performer in each metric? Could could that be calculated? Yes, to my knowledge, that could be calculated. Because I think that was sort of an, an interest of the staff and the board was to understand the high performers, uh, given the complexity that a high performer in one area may be a low performer in the other area, and that that we understand that those things are maybe counter, you know, um, you know, related and opposite for some reason, but trying to understand where a high performer, whether it's a 75th or a 90th percentile in each one of those light items would be, I think that's how you approached the all ACO comparison group, correct? That is correct. And, you know, I should just note, we can continue to iterate, you know, yep. forever on, on yep. drafts, and we are happy to continue conversations about improvements that are crucial. Every improvement requires more money be spent because of the way this contract is structured to try to meet the the baseline budget order requirements. So there's a, an expense associated with the vendor obtaining the data, organizing it, generating a report, and then we pay hourly for everything they do. So we we can do that, and we are happy to have that conversation. But ultimately, we are hoping to soon get to a final template that we Agreed. could provide consistently, you know, on a semi-annual basis and therefore minimize some of those development costs. I totally agree. I was just trying to understand how, how you were referring to that, that data. So I was just trying to understand if that each one of those lines was had significant skew to it or if it was, uh, you know, if it was really uh, difficult to interpret those percentiles, but but it's Ultimately, for me, I think in our team, it's the directionality that we're interested mm -hmm. in and, um, you know, the signals of where we might be far off, where we're a, a deviant from, you know, uh, whatever benchmark you, benchmark you want to identify. It, ultimately, this is a tool to improve care for us. Um, and so that's what we're really trying to pivot to. We've spent the last year or more trying to develop the methodology, the the actual reports. Now we want to use the information. So yeah. I think you're asking I, good I, questions. I, you know, I yep. think it's it's certainly conversation we could have with your staff as well next week when we meet with a vendor. Um, and then my question is just kind of what's good enough and through which lens for us to be able to move forward. And I agree that the the change over time i mean a lot of these things i think if we've talked about over and over again you know our low total cost of care for medicare patients in vermont is that one care's responsibility in doing or is that where where we are and what we're interested in is sort of what's the effect that can be changed over time um in these various these various data points so i, I appreciate that understanding the one last question I have for you goes back to the executive compensation. Actually, it doesn't go back to the executive compensation. Well, it's related to, but it's the 2% budget order. And I guess the question that, that I have is, was there ever a consideration of reducing, uh, you know, given the salary structures through UVM Health Network of executive salaries based on the 50th percentile with bonuses up to the 65th, where most other salaries are more, I believe, in the 40th, the 50th percentile. Was there ever a consideration of reducing executive salaries as opposed to not filling uh, open positions and thus offloading some of the hard work that the workers at One Care are doing? Uh, we had already taken a step in that direction, probably didn't discuss it with you publicly back in the summer or fall, but when it came to inflation and compensation adjustments, we already had made a move to be able to differentially uh, provide increases to staff under a certain threshold of uh, annual income. And so that was already considered. Uh, I think to your point, we really pay attention to the way that um, compensation relates to national market scans and uh, likenesses between appropriate positions. So we did not make a decision or our board did not make a decision to uh, cut those specific salaries further through the 2% admin. Instead, we looked at the vacancies and other savings that Tom Boris described already. And is still the uh, salaries for non-executives at OneCare, are they based in the 40th to 50th? 
percentile compared to national benchmarks where executives are the 50th with bonus up to 65th? I would want to double check that for you, Dr. Merman. I believe I saw some data that suggests that it's higher than that 40th to 50th, but we, we can get that. that. That would be really helpful. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks. I have two quick things. Um, one, I made a quip about Dr. Merman's bonus. I should just clarify that that was a joke. And um, there are no bonuses for care board members, um, but I have a lot of admiration for Dave's work. And um, the, the quip was supposed to reflect my admiration for his contributions to the board, not that we actually get bonuses because we do not. Um, second, on the hospital um, uh, PCP payments, um, you know, $10 million, I think it was, is, is a lot of money. And I received a message that generally the answer when we asked hospitals this was that the money was not being dedicated to primary care, that it was going more towards general operations. Um, so if that's accurate, um, then that's a very large amount of money that is in the one care budget to support primary care that may not be pulling through all the way. Um, so I think that's something that is an opportunity to think about how to ensure that that money is actually achieving what it's there for, um, because these numbers sliding backwards um, and the benchmarking report for primary care is really, really concerning. Um, and if $10 million of the primary care provider support money is not pulling through, that's a big, big, big difference in the budget. So I just wanted to flag that. And I haven't diligenced that myself, so we should look into it, but I think I just wanted to flag it. Um, and with that, I'll turn it to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Holland, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound good, thank you. Great, thank you so much for all your work today. Um, for the record, Sam Peich, Health Policy Analyst with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. A um, couple questions and then a couple comments. Uh, the first one, it's kind of a more specific question, if that's all right. It's pulling from the adaptive report that OneCare submitted specifically in the staffing FTEs. In the previous budget submission for FY22, there was kind of breakout categories for value-based care. There was like an analytics, quality care coordination and prevention, and now it seems like they're all uncategorized. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that. Sure, from an operational perspective, it's because as part of this effort to simplify and focus, we unified the team under the umbrella of value-based care. Um, and this evolved, Sam, as we then were also making the transition of our staff, our, our data and analytics staff um, into the new arrangement. So our care coordination, our quality staff, they're all working in a unified fashion to support these strategies. Okay, thank you. That's what I figured, but I just wanted to clarify. Um, I want to thank member Holmes and member Lund for the questions around the mental health screening project and just follow up a little bit on that. I think as we all know, we have a deep provider shortage in the state, particularly mental health providers and therapists. So I'm wondering if you have given any thought about the ramifications of, you know, supporting increased screening, which will very likely result in an increase in mental health diagnoses or diagnoses independent of incentivizing, at least it doesn't seem like there's any corresponding incentive for increasing access to providers. So I'm just wondering about the scenario where more people are receiving diagnoses, but you know many people are experiencing challenges finding someone to take care of their needs. I can answer from my perspective. The initiative will supply money to primary care if they perform the duties, you know, the, if they agree with the um, what we have set forth in that policy. I don't see that it's going to cost them a lot of money to make those improvements, and therefore they could use that money to supply more mental health provision. So that could be telehealth, that could be a part-time behavioral therapist in their office. Um, it's up to them what they do with that money, but there shouldn't be a great expense to do more screening. Um, screening is already something we do. A lot of people are just not recording it in a field where it can be digitally reported. So I think, um, you know, if it were my decision in my practice, I would probably use some of that money to expand mental health provision, whether it's my own time or a specialist of some sort, a mental health um, trained person or telehealth for that matter. 
That's helpful. Thank you. Um, in response to the, some of the board questions, this relates to the relationship or maybe not relation, lack of a relationship with UVM's Population Health Services Organization. You wrote in, in part, I'm quoting, the Population Health Services Organization is UVM Health Network's solution to improve population health management and performance and value-based contracts across its affiliates. Its focus is on providing high quality, actionable data to monitor and improve performance. In this way, its goals are similar to one care, just with a different reach. I'm wondering if there have been any discussions to date about one care's relationship with the population health services organization and if it's going projected to change in any way. Uh, Sam, thanks for your question. I think, you know, we're continuing to explore um, the functions that the PHSO is building out and the results that they will get, um, you know, be they fantastic or, or otherwise. And I think there's opportunities in that space for facilitating that dissemination of best practices. I think, you know, it is our job uh, at One Care as Management to look for any duplications, any efficiencies that we can gain. And that's a continual process for us. So that would include, you know, are there things that the PHSO is doing that maybe One Care wouldn't need to, or vice versa? So that will be something that we do on a regular basis. But there's nothing definitive, uh, you know, at this point. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, just a couple of quick comments to, to close out, and I'll turn back to you, Chair Foster. Um, I want to support Chair Foster's concerns around the benchmarking report analysis, as well as the need to kind of cross account and crosswalk those payments um, to primary care and whether or not it's being utilized. I think it's important to really get more clarity about that. Um, and just briefly around executive converse, compensation, we are concerned with how this executive pay structure and the process measures that connect to it look to Vermonters and what it says to Vermonters who are struggling to afford the care that they need. We don't dispute the UVM Health Network has the right to structure its corporate compensation as it sees fit with its local board and board statutes and rules, but by law, because one care is a part of the network, it is still an accountable care organization subject to rules and requirements of ACOs in the state. So those are different from the ones that govern hospitals. So I just want to make sure that that's, that's clear. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'll open it up to public comment via the raise your hand function. Uh, Ms. Wasserman, how are you? Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, I'm fine. Um, I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Um, the first uh, issue is the uh, administrative costs of the ACO, which have been discussed quite a lot today. Um, at Wednesday's meeting with staff presentation, it, it was described as a 2.6% reduction from the original uh, budget to the revised. 2% um, of that 2.6% was mandated by the Green Mountain Care Board due to the affordability crisis. Um, and so I'm left wondering if the 0.6% is all that the ACO has reduced its administrative uh, operations budget, even given that they've lost 22 to 30% of their attributed lives. Now I understand, and it's been uh, uh, highlighted today, that um, there are fixed costs. But we uh, we're talking about real money here, $15 million a year. And um, over the course of the seven years, we're talking $100 million. As I, I want to underscore, $100 million is a lot of money. And I guess the question is, even though uh, these are fixed costs, what's the return on investment? And I'm asking that rhetorically, so I don't expect you to answer it, but I think we all have to uh, look at the question of what is the return on investment. Um, my next point is that um, this issue of the population health payments to primary care physicians and the issue of um, so much of it going to the hospitals, 10 and a half million, and um, uh, Chair Foster just 
describing that uh, much of that goes to the hospital's bottom line. Uh, a couple points. I don't think that the that one care can continue boasting about all this money that they're giving to primary care to make primary care stronger and more fortified if um, they they can't even um, actually account for the ten and a half million that goes to hospitals. And in fact, if that ten and a half million dollars doesn't go towards primary care, improving or fortifying or strengthening primary care, um, I don't think you can continue to represent it that way. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, uh, the data that was distributed, uh, that was um, presented today, uh, the independents are bearing more risk than the hospital-based primary care physicians. So I think that's a pretty important thing. Uh, they're bearing, uh, independents are hanging on by a shoestring. Uh, uh, they're, har they're hardly surviving in a, a situation where we have a crisis in primary care and access. And yet they're bearing more risk. Uh, I, don't, I don't know which slide it is, um, but uh, they're bearing more risk than the hospital-based primary care physicians. That was a slide earlier in your presentation today. Um, in, in terms of primary care, uh, the and the access problem that's been uh, dis discussed today. Uh, yes, it's true. The problem is very systemic. But my question for One Care is, why hasn't One Care made good on its promise to increase uh, the number of primary care physicians or expand capacity? And as I've said in some of my written comments, this was. Um, uh, the, one of the biggest issues in 2016 when the uh, ACO and the all-pair model was coming into uh, a fruition. They were promised, they promised to address our primary care access problem. Um, and Dr. Merman, you, you asked whether the One Care has uh, initiatives to reduce hospital costs. And in the same vein, um, as the only ACO in the state, with hospital costs escalating, my opinion is that One Care should definitely address that issue. And my final comment is with regard to the mental health, the new mental health 1.6 million to primary care to do mental health screening and follow up. Um, it's been implied, but I'll say it openly. I think it's a bit of a hollow proposal that pretends to address the mental health crisis, but it doesn't really do so. And that's because as people have said, uh, primary care physicians can identify many patients who need mental health services, but there's nowhere to send them. And yeah, sure, uh, the extra money can be used to um, uh, maybe bring in some mental health resources as Dr. Wolfman has said, but many of the independent practices are struggling to survive. And I, I'm not sure that, um, that it would work that way. Um, but um, most importantly, uh, Dr. Wolfman, you did mention that um, referrals could be made to the DAs, but I'd like to point out that this new One Care revised budget cuts the DA budget by 44%. And so it's a, that's why I suggested that this is a bit of a hollow proposal because we're asking for more, for more, we're asking pr practitioners to um, uh, make more referrals for people who need services, but uh, One Care is actually cutting uh, the DAs who provide uh, mental health practitioners. And as we all know, there is a huge shortage of practitioners and we can't pretend otherwise. Thank you. Ms. Wasserman. Um, Mr. Davis, your hand is up, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have two comments. The first I think is that uh, this is sort of an air of unreality here. The green, I think that the One Care Vermont uh, complicated, uh, multifaceted, but it basically doesn't have any power, any power to affect hospitals at all. Uh, the hospitals are going to do what they want to do. If they, if it, if the one care can help them, they'll take that. If, but if they see something, they're doing something that is not necessarily a good thing to do, they're going to do it because they think they need the money. 
Um, and there's just nothing anybody can do about that. The only one that can actually do anything about it, in fact, is the Green Mountain Care Board. They're the only ones with power, okay, to move hospital budgets. The second thing I'd point out is the major effect of One Care Vermont, it seems to me, is it flows from its essential, its its origin in in Obamacare, and it, the tie of that that issue to shifting from fee for service reimbursement to to um, capitated care. If you the network, the UBM network has has about sixty percent of the care, but the other forty percent of the care is all fee for service, straight out fee for service. If somebody, you or anybody else, either either the, say the Green Mountain Care Board or the federal government wants to shift the forty the the uh, spending in the forty percent of the non UBM network money, if they want to shift that from fee for service to capitation, it's only the what what the what the federal legislation contemplates is that that's what you would use a that's what you would use an ACO for. That's mainly what its its purpose is. Now the question, there's nothing the one that one care itself can do to advance that really. They can talk about it and they can have encouraged and all that so and so and so and so. But the reality is that the that in in order to go to get in order to get that 40% of your total hospital spending in from fee for service to capitation is 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 going to be is 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 simply going to be you're going is is you're going to have to get those forty percent of people into a into a ACO. That's what an ACO is for, and so that is that is the so the so the even after all of this time, the value of the of One Care Vermont is still essentially potential. Thank you. Um, I, I recently got some feedback that one thing I should be doing with public comment is if folks were um, associated with a regulated entity or um, previously associated or received compensation from regulated entities that it be disclosed. Because um, a lot of people don't know, you know, if someone worked for Vaz, what that is or whatever else. So, um, Ms. Wasserman, um, do you work for a regulated entity or have you received compensation from one? And Mr. Davis, same question. Oh, thanks for the, for the question. I do not work for a regulated entity and I do not receive any compensation. Um, my work is pro bono. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis? Uh, my turn. Uh, I worked for, I worked for Fannie Allen Healthcare in the early 1990s, about 25 years ago. Uh, and I had no, have not, uh, that was the last 25 years, I've had no connection whatsoever with any paying industry. Uh, my wife would tell you that. Great, thank you. Um, and I see one more hand up. I, I believe it's Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman, uh, I'm aware that you previously worked for One Care, I think, a while ago, but I'll let you go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, it was a brief tenure. Um, I will, uh, I'd like to pick up the subject of crisis. Um, when we look at organizational crisis, and in many respects, I've, vo I've voiced this before, you all function as the, the board for, uh, the board of trustees for this organization in many respects. And when trustees look at an organization they steward that's in crisis, we have the option to either uh, defer and allow, uh, as Hemingway said, bankruptcy to happen slowly and then all at once. We have the option to um, refine the mission and to take away from the crisis, the signals that tell us what are our core functions and where have we failed. Um, and for once, I agree with Ham Davis and I underscore Member Walsh's assertions. This is largely a uh, payment disbursement mechanism at this point. Um, we cannot even account for necessarily how payments are dispersed to the primary care providers that they're meant to arrive at. 
rather than falling to the bottom line of a hospital. So when we talk about fixed costs in a crisis, uh, everything becomes variable, as Member Walsh said. And we begin to look at how do we refine this down to what is essential so that we can uh, not risk a total loss. And let's be clear, a total loss to the state would be our um, discussing what became of the hundreds of millions that we attempted in this over the last couple, well, rather seven years. Um, a couple more comments on crisis. Uh, you know, the the impetus or the, the real signal that there was crisis was when essentially the only commercial payer in the state pulled out and spent roughly five minutes during the fall season telling us that they they just can't point to any benefit that they've gained from their investments over the years. Um, so it's it doesn't go unnoticed that there was no mention today trying to signal some encouragement about the state of the crisis by suggesting we are back at the table and 2024 looks optimistic. Um, and I will say that more concerning, if there's ever a signal in the corporate world of the severity of crisis, it's that leadership jump ship and take off. And so I'll just point out the elephant in the room today. The CEO of this organization has determined that um, they are better off elsewhere. After telling us for years their um, lifelong devotion to Vermont healthcare reform and it being the raison d'etre for their uh, work in the state. Um, lastly, I'll just point this out. It's probably unknown to many of you that today, rather than taking up uh, legislative bill S-9 in uh, House government uh, and military operations, they've chosen to take up uh, 39, which makes sure that before they leave the session, they'll all have access to the most affordable health care, which is free health care. Um, they have decided to forego bringing up S-9, uh, which was precipitated by an independent agency, elected body in the state and the um, state auditor's office, diligently trying to make sure that health care was as affordable as possible for this state. And so um, through a really misfortunate um, judicial ruling, powers were clawed back from the state auditor's office, precluding its ability to uh, represent Vermonter's interests in having the most affordable health care they can. Um, I guess I would ask this board today, uh, since since what the legislator legislature has been telling, mostly representing the many lobbied interests that have showed up, uh, telling the auditor that the auditor can get the uh, information he seeks from the state agencies rather than the contractors, what prevents this board from conditioning an approval of a apparently non-amended budget request that should have been amended? Um, would they finally agree to give you the documents so that you could then convey them to the state auditor so that Vermonters in the midst of an affordability crisis could have confidence that what scarce dollars there are in the system have been spent as they were intended? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, and I, I did see, Ms. Lohner, that you have a new position. I want to congratulate you and thank you for your work here in the state. And um, we, of course, look forward to working with your interim and future uh, management. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to say that um, my decision to leave One Care was personal, given the point of time I am in my life right now and other commitments I have and have nothing to do with my devotion to health care reform and for Vermonters to live a healthier, more fulfilling life in Vermont. So just to correct any assumptions made by Mr. Hoffman about my intent. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other public comment at this time. Um, is there any new business to come before the board? 
any old business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Second. No. Second. Second. Oh, we got all kinds of action. I like it. <laughs> all right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All thank right. Thank everyone. you very, thank you very much, one care and your team. You put in a lot of work and I appreciate it. Have a good day. Uh, could I just ask a couple of quick questions, uh, Mr. Foster, if it's no trouble? Um, please, do you just need me or do you need everybody? Uh, well, actually, I need, um, let's see, I had a question for Mr. Boers and uh, Mr. Merman. Mr. Sure. Boers, you mentioned when you were talking about, yes, but that's all, that's the only two I had questions. Uh, you mentioned when you were talking about um, the budget, um, did you say a lot of the advertising went to Mont Digger? I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Vermont Digger. Oh, of course. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, well, I've got a bit of an accent. Vermont, D-I-G-G-E-R. Thank you yes. so much. And then we talked about, um, uh, Mr. Merman, you talked about uh, the ER. Did you say in Chipman County? Oh, Chittenden. Could you spell that for me? C-H-I-T-T-E-N-D-E-N. Thanks so much. And then just a couple more. Um, Mr. Hoffman's, do you, does, it, does anyone know Mr. Hoffman's first name by any chance? Robert. R-O-B-E-R-T. Thank you so much. And then, um, oh, I just wanted to ask who seconded at the beginning of the meeting. I heard Mr. Walsh, I believe, and did Mr. Merman second the minutes at the beginning of the meeting as well? I believe I did. You did. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Foster, for allowing me that time to get that uh, clarification, and I'm all set. Thank you all so much. Of course. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mark.